So I got this program for you, and I, I'll tell you what's happening so that you know. This thing is fully charged, so I'll give you the charger if you want to. If you need help with clicking. on the plasma screen. Okay, so that's All right. this is working. I'll put this right in here. I'm gonna just do a, you want to say a few, a few words like Hello, hello. Just to like pretend you're like, hey, how are you doing? Hey, hello, hello. Okay. It's hard to tell if it, the, the biggest point is for us to record it. Yes. Let me actually hit mute for a second because I've actually got it on. Down the button and talk for a second. Hello? Hello, everyone? If everybody can start moving towards their seats. Let's, let's go ahead and start moving towards our seats. We have a lot of great information that we're going to be covering tonight. So we want to get going on that. Hello there. How are you doing? You're going to have Good. to be louder. OK. OK, everybody. Can you hear that? OK. If everybody can start moving towards their seats, we have lots to cover tonight. And so we want to get going. Lots of great information. Do you want to announce this is the show? Yeah. People know that the event is being video recorded and may be broadcast so that if anyone is really freaked out by that, then they should know that the event is being video recorded. 
I don't think anyone's really freaked out. This okay. Is a pretty yeah. Thing. Yep. Um, so I'm watching the Facebook Live with you because it's like a question and it's Mary Ivy and she's just like going back and forth and she's like saying this. And she's like okay. Saying this. Great. Okay, everybody. Um, uh, just a couple of notices here. Um, for those who haven't found out already, we have restrooms over here to my right. We have, um, in case of an emergency or you know, fire, which I don't anticipate by any means, but we have exits over here to the left. We have stairs, and we have exits to my right. We have stairs down also, and we have, of course, the doors go out to the, the, the ceiling there, or to the rooftop, but, uh, but we have stairs on both sides. Um, we have uh, complimentary water um, and cookies, lots of great, wonderful cookies over there. So y'all help yourself. We have some great speakers tonight. Um, everything is, um, this, this, um, pres all the presentations are going to be recorded. And uh, we're actually going to be on Facebook Live. We had a, a full... Uh, maximum attendance for this and so we looked into it and uh, we were able to put it on Facebook for so those that weren't able to get in or are, are able to um, to watch this at home on their computer and uh, if you want to watch it again later on if you uh, have too much information that you can't absorb it all you'll be able to watch it later on too so it'll be um, broadcast by uh, Commodore Productions here at Gulf Coast and um, with that, I um, want to um, thank um, this whole event is a team effort that was put together by uh, the Florida Native Plant Society, the Sweet Bay Chapter, the Audubon Society, the Bay Conservancy of Bay County, uh, the, um, uh, the Master Gardeners, the Bay County Master Gardeners, and, uh, um, and Gulf Coast here. And um, it's been a, a wonderful, wonderful um, coordination, just all the planning. It's been great to see how all the, the different groups have come together to make this happen. Um, get real excited. We have um, how, how tonight's going to work is we're going to have a presentation. We're going to give away some door prizes. We've got some great plants. We were able to get a grant um, the, um, that's uh, able to... Um, purchased for us um, through the Audubon Society, the, the Burke, um, uh, what is the name of the, the foundation? Let me get the, make sure I get the exact right name. The Coleman and Susan Burke Center of Native Plants was able to provide funding that uh, in your little bag, there's a booklet on gardening for wildlife that we were able to pay for that and we were also to pay for some uh, door prizes, which was a wonderful thing. So um, you'll see there some wonderful plants, and uh, we'll be giving those away. So after each talk, we'll give away some door prizes. We'll have three talks doing that. We'll have a little break, and then you can look around at all our tables, and then we'll resume, and we'll, f we'll finish with the last two talks. So uh, looking forward to it, and um, I'm going to uh, um, go ahead. We'll have our first speaker. We'll have Dr. Todd Engstrom. He's joining us from Tallahassee. Uh, Dr. Todd Engstrom, uh, he graduated from Florida State University with a degree in avian ecology. Ah, okay. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a hard one for me to remember. Uh, went to Cornell University, um, then went back to, um, uh, came back down to Florida, saw the light, came back to Tall Timbers Research Laboratory, um, worked there, and he's uh, worked some with Florida State University, and um, he's a wealth of knowledge about birds, and we're really looking forward to hearing him tell us about the state of the birds. Can everybody hear me all right? All right. Thanks for coming, and it, I'm really pleased to, to come over to Panama City and talk to you all. I think it's terrific that a number of conservation organizations got together to, to uh, uh, have this evening. <clears throat> I've been invited to sort of be the, the setup man. I give you the big picture on what's happening in bird populations throughout the entire continent 
of North America, but we're going to bring it down to the local level and think about some of the birds that are <clears throat> in most conservation need. And what I'd ask you to do is, yes, I'm going to be talking at the, at the big level and thinking about the things that affect bird populations, but you need to think at multiple scales. You need to think at the big level, but you also can think of your own backyard. I'm not going to be talking too much about native plants. There are plenty of people who follow me who are going to do a, a fine job at that. Okay, so let's see. Do I have to? No. We're all here. Here, let's pull this up. Here it is. Okay. Um, just the title, The State of North America's Birds, is pretty audacious, and I wouldn't pretend to be able to talk about that. Uh, you get an idea of just how complex that might be if it weren't for very large organizations that have done tremendous amount of work over decades on this topic, uh, both Partners in Flight and the North American Bird Conservation Initiative. Uh, the the uh, uh, goals of Partners in Flight are helping species at, re at, at risk keeping common birds common, and I think that's particularly important to tonight, uh, thinking about what you can do very locally, and then do both of those, achieve both of those through voluntary partnerships. The uh, NABSI, or the North American Bird Conservation Initiative, uh, took it upon themselves now they produce an annual report, the state of birds, and it's a huge effort uh, that is the result of let's see, many, many organizations. I just I throw this up here to show you that uh, <clears throat> this is a sampling, but there's Mexican organizations, there are Canadian organizations, and there are United States organizations that are all working together to think about how to uh, address these birds that are moving from the Arctic to the tropics and, and back again, and they do this every year. So uh, it requires a lot of cooperation among the various groups. <clears throat> of North American birds, about 350 are tri-national, meaning that they they spend at least part of their annual cycle in Canada, part, or at least flying over the United States, and then down into uh, Central and South America. So um, you can understand why it's critical to think about, you have a lot of different phases of their life history that you have to pay attention to in, uh, for, for true conservation of the species. So it takes international cooperation for bird conservation because, of course, birds don't recognize national boundaries. Uh, this report card that I, that I spoke of, the, the annual re report card, they end up with graphs that look like this. And by the way, uh, I was part of the early years of Partners in Flight, but I, am, I didn't have anything to do with this. A friend of mine sent me uh, uh, this, which is part of their uh, report. But <clears throat> they, they make a list of all the species, and then they very systematically go through and evaluate each species. And I'll, I'll go into that in a minute. But you end up with something like this, where uh, the species
species are divided or, or you look at them in different uh, sort of habitats, if you will, and you can see that birds of oceans and tropical and subtropical forests are the most in crisis. Now, tropical and subtropical forests, we're talking about those forests in Mexico only, not down into, uh, further into Central America and South America. And you get the idea, grassland sort of intermediate, and then all the way, the generalist cardinals, mockingbirds. There are very few birds that, ha that have a, a, a wide hab habitat tolerance and so forth that are in any kind of conservation trouble. These, the, the ones in the red, the percentages in the red refer to the, uh, the bird species that are in trouble. <coughs> so this organization pays attention to full life cycle, meaning from the breeding grounds, migration, all the way to Central America. <coughs> I particularly like this graph, okay? Maybe can't read all that, but the red and yellow are colors for where this bird, the magnolia warbler, breeds. So where they're, where they're most common is where it's the deepest red, where it's yellow, they're less common. Then in migration, this is the, the birds are moving all across the uh, Central and Southern Amer United States, primarily through the Central United States, and they come around the Gulf Coast. They, not too many of them come around Florida during the fall, this is, uh, or during migration. And then they end up in, mostly in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, a couple things to notice about this, or one very important thing, look how much smaller the winter range is than where they are breeding. So uh, that's a tremendous concentration of birds. So mm, if you're looking at the whole bird or full cycle uh, conservation, you'd say, we better pay attention to that because there are a lot of birds in a fairly small area. All right. <coughs> This is just a summary slide, but the, the, the important point here, 50, 52 million birders in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. An estimate, of course. And some are gonna be very uh, gung-ho birders, and some are gonna be backyard birders. Uh, and they spend about $14 billion annually on bird seed, uh, optical equipment, cameras, uh, binoculars. So it's, it's a very important economically for a resource that we all care about, uh, the bird life of North America. All right. Again, this is a report. Now I showed you that, that report card that was a nice graphic, but in addition to that, and any of you can go on their website and get this, you can actually get an Excel file of all all the species of birds in North America in their relative degree of risk. They're all evaluated. This is what it looks like. And I don't expect you to look at this. I just wanted to give you an impression. Uh, these are the birds that were deemed at risk, at most at risk, or some of the birds that were deemed most at risk. <coughs> Um, yeah, they're an estimated, they're over or, or nearly 1,200 species of North American birds. And of those 1,200 species, and again, that's Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And of those 1,200 uh, birds, about 432 species have uh, concern scores of 14 or higher, or we know that their, their populations are declining uh, steeply. Well, that's great, 430, uh, but 
how in the world did you arrive at, did we arrive at that? And I'm going to give you, uh, very briefly give you an overview of, of uh, how they arrive at these things. Uh, people, ornithologists, flocks of ornithologists spent hundreds and hundreds of hours in committees poring over data and, and, and consulting population size, breeding distribution, non-breeding distribution, threats to breeding, threats to non-breeding, and population trends. And it's a complicated uh, set sets of data that they go over, but um, I'm going to talk about just one aspect of it to give you a feeling that they're not just pulling these numbers from the air. Does anyone know of Chan Robbins? Okay, no. Okay, that's all right. Uh, Chan Robbins was a just a remarkable individual, and he started what's called the Breeding Bird Survey. And the Breeding Bird Survey is a citizen science. It's one of the uh, uh, fairly old and very, very effective citizen science projects in the world. In fact, the Breeding Bird there's really nothing else like the Breeding Bird sur Survey anywhere else in the world. What Chan did was he said we need, he, he was concerned about the silent spring, Rachel Carson, and so he said we've got to be able to tell if bird populations are changing in response to pesticides. How are we going to do that? Well, first of all, you had to have, um, you had to make it, do it scientifically so we could depend on the results. And what he did is he came up with a method whereby he set up 20, essentially 25 mile routes uh, at each half mile an observer would stop and listen and record all birds seen or heard in the three minute period. Then go on to the next one and they start just before dawn and go on until the mid morning. Okay, and he said, I bet there are a lot of ornithologists and amateur birders who are very good who would contribute to that. And sure enough, he established these routes. That's what it looks like just in the United States. It also occurs in Canada. If you want to see what it looks like for Florida, these are the routes. Okay, again, these are 25 mile routes that where you stop uh, every half mile and record every three minutes. Um, he started that in the mid 1960s. So what, ha what happens is for each of those routes, year after year after year, you get standardized estimates of how many birds of a given species there are at that place. Here's what, it, here's what one of the results looks like. Um, for the wood thrush, we can see that they're most abundant, okay, in West Virginia, uh, part of Ohio, and down here in Mississippi. That's where they're, they're most frequently seen. That's over, over decades. Not only that, but we can look at changes over time. And you can see that the, the abundance of wood thrush has decreased by nearly 50% from the mid-1960s to, the, to the, uh, relatively recently. Then if you sort of put those together, so you have a spatially explicit uh, view of that, you can see that throughout the entire eastern United States, the wood thrush is declining rapidly. That's what the red is. But then over here in the Midwest, it's not doing so, so bad. But remember that the highest abundance of wood thrush was in the eastern United States. So where, it's, where it was most abundant, it's not doing very well. Okay, now, uh, again, we have 14, uh, 1,200 species. Now we've narrowed it down to 400, but that's still more than we want to deal with. So I'm just going to talk about the, the panhandle birds, and that is from Jefferson County West to, to narrow it down a little further. Okay, um, how many species occur in the panhandle? Well, recently I did a study of the Apalachicola River Basin and the birds of the Apalachicola River Basin. And based on a variety of sources, 
Um, there, are, um, there are 350 species for just that basin. So I think it's a, a fairly uh, safe uh, guess that there are probably about 400 species of birds that have, been, that have occurred in the panhandle of Florida. That's, that's a pretty big number. That's 75% of all birds that, that occur in Florida. All right, so again, this is just a recap. About 1,200 species, 400 and, uh, uh, 432 species that, are, that are have, we have some conservation concern about. And then taking that, that list of 400, and then I went through just uh, uh, within the last couple months, and I went through and said, okay, which of those 400 occur in the panhandle? Well, you narrow it down, and about 50 species on the North American Bird Conservation Initiative list occur in the Florida panhandle. There are five species that only are here during the breeding season. There are two that are extinct. Uh, Backman sparrow, uh, Backman's warbler, and the ivory bill woodpecker. 14 species that only migrate through our area. 11 residents, one transient, of all things, the, uh, the uh, magnificent frigate bird, and then 17 winter visitors. Now again, that, those are species that are of conservation concern in the panhandle. How am I doing on time? Perfect. Okay, uh, I'm just going to quickly go over the list of species in each of these groups. Uh, least tern, uh, some warblers, and the wood thrush. What, what things would affect those? Well, one thing that certainly is important to the decline of the wood thrush is habitat fragmentation in the eastern United States. Um, <clears throat> what happens when you occur, when you uh, chop up what was extensive habitat is uh, many predators find it easier to, to find the nests of, of these ground nesting birds. These are some birds of concern that are migrants that just pass by. Uh, yellow rail and uh, of course hooping crane, that's, that's not really fair because that's an introduced species, but that's all right. Uh, some shorebirds uh, and, and a few warblers again. Well, as an example of what's important to the migrants, of one thing that's very important is the stopover habitat. You probably know that when birds uh, migrate south, they, they'll frequently gang up right here in the, in the, uh, along the, the uh, uh, shore uh, before they cross the Gulf of Mexico. And they need to fatten up when they're, when they're here because these birds, they're coming from the northern United States or Canada, and they fly, uh, they go through what's a, a period called hyperphagia where they just eat, 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 and put on a tremendous amount of fat, and they burn that off when they're flying. Now, these birds, these migrant birds are... Uh, they call them neotropical migrants. They're going to, to and from the neotropics. And most of these are nocturnal migrants. So they're migrating at night. Um, and <clears throat> I'll talk about another uh, uh, threat or challenge for these birds a little later, uh, communication towers. But the habitat, the quality of the habitat, both uh, on barrier islands and along the coast can be very important for these migrant birds. Okay, here's some birds that are only, only occur here in the winter on, in the uh, 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 panhandle. And some sparrows. Uh, some of these, the two hummingbirds, of course, those are western birds. They only, they, they're pretty rare here, but I threw them in here so you get an idea. Some birds, uh, the panhandle is more important to than others. This is a bird, the Henslow sparrow, that um, one of the most important wintering grounds 
anywhere in the United States occurs on the savannas of Appalachian National Forest. Have you all seen those savannas? Has anybody been over there to see, see those? It's, they're, they're really amazing places, very, very big. But one of the, the threats to that habitat is uh, uh, making sure we, we burn the areas frequently so that trees don't invade. If trees invaded, uh, and they would be pine trees, we would lose that openness and probably lose the sparrows' uh, prime habitat in the winter. Uh, these are some residents. Some of these are, are very familiar. Uh, one I'll talk about a little bit is the red cockaded woodpecker. We all know about that one. Um, but this is a success story. I think that if we continue on in the management trajectory we're on, there's no reason in the world why this bird couldn't be recovered. We know how to do it. It's just the persistence to make sure that they have the habitat uh, they need to, um, uh, to maintain themselves. 80, but an important thing to know is 80% of all red cockaded woodpeckers are on public land. So uh, national forests, military bases, uh, state forests, and so forth, uh, they're, they're, they're largely gone from private lands, with a few notable exceptions. Uh, Tallahassee is in what's called the Red Hills. Tallahassee to Thomasville, the hunting plantations, they have not been extensively, uh, the timber has not been extensively harvested. So that has the largest population of red cockaded woodpeckers on private lands. Okay, so the threats are habitat loss, uh, collisions with television towers, or communication towers, pesticides, cats, climate change. Those are all really big things, and there's only one of those that you're in your house and you're trying to do the best for the birds. Cats is one thing that is real important. Uh, if you want to learn more about the role of cats, visit the American Bird Conservancy webpage. They have a real good section on the effects of, bird, of cats on birds. Uh, and, and what you can do about it. So what do birds need? They, they definitely need um, your attention and help. And again, going back to think of, thinking on multiple scales, well, how can all of us as citizens do something for bird conservation? Um, you can think on the big scale and try to help organizations that, that deal with conservation on the large scale by making a contribution to National Audubon or the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. You can also participate as a citizen science, scientist in uh, programs that contribute to our understanding. For example, again, this is, um, this is data. I showed you that uh, the earlier uh, image of the, of the Magnolia Warbler range, this is the same technology. Let me ask, does anyone use eBird here? Okay, there's just a couple people who know about eBird. eBird is a program run by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, and if you know your birds pretty well, anybody can contribute to eBird. So all you do, you have an app on your cell phone and every time you go birding, you record the birds that you see or hear within a time period for a given site. All right. Millions of people are contributing to eBird. Maybe it's not millions, but it's certainly hundreds of thousands around the world. And what happens is all those contributions, you're documenting a number of individuals of a species at a time or a place. That all goes into supercomputers at Cornell and they can generate maps that look like this over time. And I highly recommend it. I wasn't able to download it on, for this presentation, but you can actually do animations so you can see a full life cycle, color coded just like this, of the bird as it, from the breeding grounds 
it migrates down, it fills up the wintering grounds, and then it starts moving back north, uh, to the north again. Uh, very, very interesting, uh, very neat uh, animations. And finally, something you can do is you pay attention locally. Uh, some of you, uh, I know I'm a homebody, I like to spend time in my yard and garden and trying to make that as bird friendly as possible. Again, keeping common birds common is a good goal for all of us and uh, something that uh, we can all achieve. And with that, I think I'll uh, end there and open it up to any questions. Anybody have any? Yes. Yes. I worked there for three years. The, the question was if you had been to the sap sucker wood? Yes. Uh, the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology is it, uh, sap sucker woods is part of the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York. And uh, when I worked there, there was a staff of 25, and I worked in a trailer. Well, if you go now, it's, there, there are probably 200 people working there now, and they've got a magnificent uh, uh, building, and they have scientists from all over the world coming to, to participate. This eBird is one of the most innovative um, citizen science things that's ever been devised. It's, it's just amazing. Yes, another question? The, the, the question was, uh, what is the latest research on the birds and communication towers? Uh, that's good. I, I happen to know a little bit about this. Just north of Tallahassee, uh, that's where Tall Timbers is located. And in the 1950s, a, a, a television tower went on the grounds of Tall Timbers. And Herbert Stoddard, who is really the founder of Tall Timbers, started to look at bird kills underneath that tower. And he and the and staff members of Tall Timbers checked that tower, under the tower. They would go and, and, and look for birds under that tower every day, every morning, for nearly 30 years. What you get, again, is you get a time series over that time. Uh, you, you get an accumulation of data over that time. Well, I, I couldn't find the slide, but on some of these, on some mornings, Herbert Stoddard went out there and there would be hundreds or thousands of birds that were killed. What happens is, in certain times of the year, the birds uh, primarily fall migration, but it happens in spring migration too. Um, again, these are nocturnal migrants, and they would be flying. It might be inclement weather. They fly a little lower in those conditions. They'd see lights associated with the tower and be attracted to the tower, and they would start to circle the tower, and they'd hit either the tower itself or the guy wire. So the latest development on what we know to minimize uh, mortality of birds at towers is lights. It's a matter of, <laughs> a friend of mine wrote a paper called, it's a matter of lights and death. And uh, the lights, again, attracts the birds, uh, but it depends on what kind of lights. And evidently, the red flashing lights are, are the most attractive to the birds. And white strobes do not seem to attract them as much. Uh, so it's just a start when you think of uh, how many thousand uh, communication towers are. We have to have the lights because of uh, uh, airplanes. But figuring out what the best way to uh, what lights might minimize that damage. Uh, it's a work in progress, but uh, this has been going on. People knew about it since the mid-50s. Are they fighting the other towers? Are they flying away? 
Uh, to my knowledge, it's just white and red. It has to be real visible. That, that's the, the key. And blue light uh, wouldn't do it. You mean if that that might uh, uh, might uh, signal to airplanes or something? Yes, we're going to have to go on okay. um, for our next speaker. We Thank you very much. To cover, but Thank you so much. Okay, um, this is what everybody's looking forward to. Plants, I know too. We're going to have door prizes here. Everybody take out your, um, your ticket. That's it. Take it out and look at the last. Um, who's, who's drawing? <laughs> okay. The first plant we're going to give away is a downy phlox. This one here with a beautiful lavender flower. And that goes to last three digits, eight, nine, one. All right, on eight. Excellent, yay. This right here, our next one is a starry rosin weed. This guy has a beautiful yellow flower. And this goes to da, 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 da. who? Zero three five. Yay. Excellent. Excellent. Our next one here. This is partridge berry. This is a wonderful evergreen ground cover that has white flowers and red berries. So this goes to nine seven nine. Da, 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 da. I misplaced my ticket. <laughs> uh, we'll do a new redraw. Okay. Yeah. Nine nine eight. Nine nine eight. Yay! All right. Enjoy. Okay. Our next one. We have a red salvia. This is a great native uh, perennial wildflower with red flowers, and this goes to zero one three. Zero one three. We're running, Daryl. <laughs> zero one three. Nope, next one. Zero, zero, four. Zero, zero, four. Oh, oh you had 979? Nine, nine? Oops, 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 oops. Okay, here. That was for a climbing aster. This is a great little wildflower bush, um, wildflower that the butterflies love. They'll just, you know, they, they love that one. And one last one is uh, we have dotted horse mint. This is one of our native Monardas that the bees and butterflies love it. So this goes to 961. 961. 961. Yay. Okay. Good, good. And uh, now we're going to turn it over to Dara Dobson. And she's going to talk to, oh, hey, we'll get your presentation up. Be it. I'm okay. I'm okay. Awesome. Hey, uh, we're really happy to have Dara Dobson here. She's going to talk to us about uh, the importance of native plants to our birds. And Dara is, uh, she came here from Defuniac Springs and she owns Seven Pines Nursery. That if any of y'all have ever been there, it's a wonderful place. Yay. Thank you. It is. It's, it's wonderful. Um, she's got a, such a wide selection of native plants and it's a great place that hear us and a panhandle can just go right on over there and uh, she's a wealth of knowledge you go there she's just she can tell you all about the the plants that are great for birds or butterflies or bees or whatever so look forward Dara hey um, actually I wanted to give you a little brief thing um, we started the nursery we retired back in 98 and we started the nursery it's a labor of love um, I do a lot of public speaking about native plants and native birds and butterflies, and I really encourage people to use native plants in their yards. 
and there wasn't a lot of areas where they could buy them. So that's why the nursery got developed. And um, so I, I just wanted to give you that little blurb because I am a plant lover. Um, why, why do you want to use native plants? I mean, if you think about it, we, it's never been so much in the forefront it is, as it is right now. We've always had a lot more native areas where native plants were growing naturally along the highways. The highways have been widened. We've lost so much of our native um, natural flora everywhere. There used to be a lot of empty lots in our neighborhoods. There's less and less empty, less and less empty lots, less and less native areas. And so when we don't use the native plants in our yards, the biodiversity just keeps shrinking. So native plants enhance our conservation of our natural resources. Uh, they're usually lower maintenance. They're usually easier to sustain. Normally, you don't have to use any pesticides with, on them. Um, but the most important reason, especially for people who love birds, the most important reason is they support our insects. And insects are very important to support your birds, because that's what your birds eat. Um, they support pollinators, spiders, and all those different little miniature little insects you never even know they're there, those always provide really vital protein for birds. Okay. Um, and are native plants the best? You know, you wonder, well, what, what's so special about a native plant? Is it any better than another plant? Not, not the plant itself is not any better, it's just that the plant species differ from one another. Okay, plant species have different leaf chemistry. They taste different to the insects. They ta the fruits taste different to the birds and the, and the wildlife. Flowers have different shapes, and the different shapes require, different insects require different shapes to land on a flower. Different birds require different flowers to land on or different fruits. So plants differ really greatly. Even within the same family of plants, there's a lot of difference. Okay? Different areas have unique soil and different growing climates. So sometimes when we bring a plant in from another area, it may not do as well, or you would have to adjust your soil. Where a native plant typically is going to like our acid soil, and typically is going to like the drainage that we have. Um, the sand's porous. A lot of people come from other areas and they go, "What's going to grow here? I all have a sand, you know." But our native plants like that sand. So if you plant the right thing, all of a sudden you'll realize gardening becomes much easier. It becomes much easier because you're not fighting against what naturally grows here. Okay, um, wildlife. Wildlife, a lot of wildlife require certain plants to survive. And many times in a big native area, there's all kinds of little plants you never even think about. And they may not even be that, that attractive, but they have supplied what that particular insect needed to reproduce. Okay? Oops. Oops. Oh, 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 oops. Went too far. Okay. So, what is a true native plant? A lot of people don't even really what, know what a true native plant is. You see Formosa azaleas, those big bright bloomed azaleas, they've been here forever, and a lot of people think they're native. They're not. So to be a true native plant, you, it had to be here at the time of European contact. That's 1500 AD. And there was actually historical evidence and documentation of those plants. And there's like 2,800 true native plants. Those are the ones that existed in Florida. All right. What's a naturalized plant? Well, a lot of people think the naturalized are just as good as natives. Some of them that are, very much so. There's about 1,300 or more of those. And some of those naturalized plants have been here a long time, over 100 years, and they've existed with no intervention from man. So they're very easy to work into your yard and to use. And some of those plants are also used by insects. Okay. What about the other plants? There's a bunch of other plants that come from other areas. And if they're not native to Florida, they're called an exotic. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with putting an exotic in your yard. The problem is if you use extensive exotics and no natives, then sometimes you're not supplying what the insects need to reproduce. Okay? There's also something called hybridized plants. And some of those hybridized plants is when they're not true natives anymore because they've changed the culture, they've changed the plant some. It's a man-made development. They've taken two plants and they've taken the, the um, they've hybridized them between two and made something different. Sometimes those plants are still very useful, but they're not a true native. And there's another thing called a, a, a selection. Excuse me, I will get that out. A selection. 
Now, selection is actually a native plant because somebody tromping in the woods saw this gorgeous coreopsis that might have been, oh my gosh, that coreopsis has brighter flowers or bigger flowers or something special about it. And they decided they wanted to tissue culture that and make some more of that one. And they gave it a name, bright yellow. That's their favorite. Oh my gosh, that one's called bright yellow. Or they found a different azalea that happened to have a variegation in the leaf. And they thought, well, that's really interesting. It was a natural occurrence. So it's still a native plant, but it has a name now. Now it's called such and such variegated. So you know, the, sometimes a, a plant that is a specialized plant like that is still considered a native plant. There's also um, about 2,500 garden species that may sometimes naturalize. We have a lot of plants that we've brought in from other areas that continue to thrive and have seeded off into the woods or the natural areas, and there's more and more of them. Um, what we see, okay, this is what we see in our yards. We often see birds eating fruits and drinking nectar. And for many that, you know, many bird species, this is an important part of their diet, okay? To support these, you should have native plants in your yard that supply those for the birds. So if you're, if you're courting birds that like fruits, you need to have fruiting things in your yard if you're comp or their seeds. So there are eight types of native blueberries. You know, you don't have to just grow blueberries because you want a fruit orchard. You can grow blueberries because the birds love them and lots of other little animals love them. And they also have little white flowers that bring in a lot of pollinators. So the blueberries are a great little shrub and there's many different sizes from the little teeny shiny blueberry to the great big high bush blueberry. So blueberries are a wonderful addition to your yard. You can use them as a hedgerow or a specimen plant. I mean, they're great, okay? There's also viburnums and there's a whole bunch of different viburnums. There's tall viburnums, obovatum, He's a great big old thing and beautiful, and they all have white flowers, and they, then they come up with these berries afterwards that are really a bird favorite. There's also dwarf viburnums, very small little guys. So if you don't have room for a big viburnum, you can go with a small viburnum. They all have the same shaped flower, okay? There's Virginia creeper. <laughs> now Virginia creeper, I'm gonna tell you, I, and that's one of the Audubon's recommendation plants. The Virginia creeper has wonderful berries on it, just gorgeous but he can be very aggressive. So you don't put, if you have a small garden, you do not put Virginia creeper in a small garden. Sometimes you may not even want to have it up by your house. So, because it can get really get away from you. That's like a trumpet vine. There's certain flowers, certain vines that are wonderfully bird attractive, but you have to really think about where you're going to put that plant because you're going to be dealing with that plant for a long time. <laughs> so, Virginia creeper is great in a further out area, in a backyard, in a fence line, or a natural area. They're wonderful. But beware of where you put that particular plant. Uh, strawberry bush, that's a cool one. It's euonymus. Comes up with this cool little strawberry looking fruit. Then it opens up with these bright, bright fire engine orange red berries. And it's actually exquisite looking. And the birds love it. The one over there, hollies. There's so many hollies you can add to your yard. Big hollies, little hollies, middle-sized hollies. There's a whole group of hollies. And it's all ilex from viol ponds to American hollies, gobs of them. And the birds like it. And it's a very pretty colorful thing you could put in the fall. Okay. And if you're courting hummingbirds, there are so many native plants that attract hummingbirds. Oh my gosh. Coral honeysuckle. Okay, it's gorgeous. We have coneflowers, royal catchfly. That's an endangered species, by the way and he's done very well up in North Florida. Um, it's actually, um, it has a little um, stickiness to it and it traps little teeny insects, okay? The Campus radicans, that's trumpet vine. That's another one you gotta watch out now. Don't put that trumpet vine next to your house. You'll be fighting that thing to, till eternity. So that's another one you put way out away from your home, but it does flower beautifully and the birds love it. The next one is firebush. You're in this, if you're in zone down here, zone nine especially, firebush is wonderful. If you're up where we are, a little colder, I have to bring my firebush inside sometimes, but it is well worth the effort. This attracts lots and lots of butterflies and hummingbirds. Columbine, if you don't have columbine yet, such a beautiful little plant. Blooms in the early, late winter, early spring. Very delicate little soft leaf with this gorgeous hanging down plant like that, like a little fairy cap. Hummingbirds love that one. Okay, here's what we don't see, okay? A big part of hummingbirds' diet, for those of you who love hummingbirds, are insects. 
don't forget they need insect food. Don't just need nectar. So when, when you're planting plants, you've got to think about what kind of pollinators and insects you're going to attract. Because if you don't, if you don't plant things that attract the insects and have the tissue that insects need for their, their larva to develop, you're going to have very fewer, a lot fewer birds. Okay? 96% of all bird species feed their young insects when they're in the nest stage. So for that couple weeks, till those nestlings leave the, the nest, those birds are looking for insects and spiders. And even birds that eat berries, they're still going to look for insects to feed those nestlings. So insects are a very important part of a bird's diet. Okay? Insects collectively are very good at converting plant tissue of all types into their own body, which means their body becomes a source of protein. They're actually, insects pound for pound contain more protein than beef. Now that's amazing. I still don't want to eat them, but, um, <laughs> but the birds do. <laughs> the birds do, and so do many other little animals. Also spiders. Spiders eat other insects, and then they become a good source of protein. So don't be killing every spider in your yard, and don't be killing all those little insects. That, that you are courting your birds by letting those things live and letting them thrive in your yard. So very important to let those caterpillars and let those little insects fly around and land on your plants. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is, in our quest for a perfect yard, we have tried everything to have no holes in our plants. That means you've sprayed them, You've bought them that had insect uh, that had insecticide up in the stems. You you pick plants that the insects don't like. You go to the store and it says insect resistant. And you go, oh, that's for me. You know, what are you doing? You're making your your yard sterile. When you start eliminating things that produce insects, all of a sudden you have no bird food for your birds. So you have to start thinking a different thought pattern. You don't want to have the perfect yard with every single plant perfect. So, now some insects will eat more plants down than others. So, you do plan to have certain plants in the background that get eaten totally. So, you have something in the forefront, forefront that maybe still looks green. So, <laughs> you don't have a naked yard. But there is a way to plan that stuff so you can support those insects and still have a beautiful yard. Okay? The other thing is, you really need to be very, very cautious and very judicious about using pesticides. Pesticides, all of you bird lovers already know that is really harmful to our birds, harmful to the insects. If you're harming the insects, you're harming your birds, okay? Also, there's plant, the plants that have the neonics, neonicotinoids in them. If you see that tag in the store, do not buy that plant. They spray those roots of a baby plant, spray the roots, before the plant even begins to grow. And that pesticide is actually in the stem of the plant. You can't wash it off. So it's very harmful to our environment. And some places, well, we, we encourage people not to use it at all. There, and some of the stores are starting to phase it out. But as a consumer, if you see that it has the neonics, stay away from that plant. Okay? Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> Neonicotinoids. <laughs> and C O T I. It's a long word. Yeah, neonicotinoid. Yes. Okay. Also, sorry, I should have actually written it up there. Okay. Also, choose Florida native plants that support insects. Our Florida insects like Florida plants. You know, I mean, there's going to be specialists like a monarch or different plants, different insects that require a specific plant, but many of our insects will like the taste of a Florida plant better than a non-native non plant, okay? The non-native plant may have supported insects in their area of the country. So we don't necessarily have the same insects in our part of Florida that they have out in Texas, and we certainly have different ones here than they have in Brazil. So just because a plant comes from another country, there's nothing wrong with that plant. It's just you've moved, moved it into a different place to live that maybe it didn't support any insects here because we didn't have that wildlife or that insect or that butterfly that uses that plant. 
So, you know, most people don't want just a 100% native yard. Some do, and that's a lot of fun to plan. It really is. But a lot of us love camellias and gingers and things that aren't native. I'm one of them. My yard is a blend. And you can blend your yard and still have your favorite non-native plants and put your native plants in with them. And so you get a good, nice mix that supports the insects, that supports all those little pollinators, and supports your birds. Okay? Plants are different from each other, so when you're choosing a non-native plant, remember, you're choosing something many times that won't support any of our insects. You may have something that, that, you know, like a Bradford pear. Bradford pears pretty much don't do anything for us. <coughs> so if you have a chance to take a Bradford pear down and replace it with a native tree, a native pear, or a crab apple, or a native plum, you're still going to get beautiful flowers, but you're going to get the pollinators that love that, and you're going to also have birds that enjoy the fruit. Okay. Use a variety of native plants to help create biodiversity. You know that typically a box store will get the same little group of plants in? Maybe, I don't know, it used to be 40, it might be more than that now. But this store will have the same ones, so will this box store have the same ones, and this store will have the same ones, and that's the big vogue that year, and everything's in style, and everybody's putting the same plant in. Well, go down the neighborhood and look at some of the yards. You'll see azaleas, and boxwoods, and azaleas, boxwoods. I mean, and there's just the biodiversity is missing. So I'm not saying not ever to use those things, but you, if you're going to have that type of yard, it really behooves you to make some kind of oasis somewhere in your yard, which you can make a little native area with a lot of stuff in it. And it can be very attractive. It doesn't have to be wild and woolly, although it can be wild and woolly and be very attractive too. But if you mow around it, or if you edge it, it looks like it's supposed to be that way. So it doesn't look like you're neglecting your yard, it just means that you're supporting all your pollinators and all your insects and all your birds. Okay, this is a, a nice example down here. A lot of times when people put, put a house in, they clear everything away, and all of a sudden it's a, just a dead oasis of dirt or sand. Look at this on the far left. <laughs> okay, over there. That's how it started. This is how it looks now. We, we, designed the native plant group for them and put them in, or actually placed them, somebody else put them in. And it is alive with butterflies and insects and birds now. So you can transform even the plainest of lots that have nothing, plainest of sand, and create something really beautiful. Okay, retrain your thinking. When you see something being eaten, a leaf being eaten, be happy. Don't kill the caterpillar. Okay? Be happy. Now, I do know that when they're on the tomatoes, you pretty much have to pick them off. <laughs> but when it's on a milkweed, you know, you can just smile and think, yes, I've got butterflies. Now, for birders, I hate to say this, it's like being a cannibal, but for birders, those birds love those caterpillars. <laughs> so, you know, if you're hoarding butterflies, you're going to lose some of them to your birds. And if you're a birder, you're going to have enough stuff to support lots of caterpillars so you can enjoy your birds and still hatch some butterflies off. So there's a happy medium in there. Leave some leaf litter in the winter. Many of our moths, our nocturnal moths, come down from where they, okay, I'll give you an example. The horned moth, uh, uh, the royal moth, he's got this huge green caterpillar, about the size of a hot dog, the most hugest thing ever. And he eats pecan leaves or either anything in that car your family. Well, you don't see the moth. It's the biggest moth of Florida. It's nocturnal. It's a royal moth. It's huge, like five or six inches big. So he goes up there and lays his eggs. The caterpillar eats the leaves. You don't see him. He comes down from the tree, lays his pupae in a pile of leaf litter. You hardly ever see that either. And then the moth hatches at night. You hardly ever see that either. But it's a wonderful cycle. And the birds like those moths. <laughs> so, and you know, many things enjoy those caterpillars. So leave some leaf litter. There's lots of little insects and things that use that leaf litter, and those birds use those insects. Okay? Don't prune away all your dead branches in the winter. I know it's just really it's it's enticing to think, oh I'm gonna clean my yard up. Clip, 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 clip. It looks so nice and neat. But you know, those branches support our birds, and there's lots of dead seed heads on those. So if you can tolerate a few dead seed heads, leave them up there. 
two things. I mean, the birds are going to enjoy the seed heads, but also you might get some little volunteers from the seeds also. So try not to clean your yard up too, too much. You can still put pine straw around it, dress it up, looks pretty good, and you can still leave those seed heads up, and you'll be encouraging that, the insects. Okay. Also, the birds use it for winter cover. Okay. All right. Some plants support more insect habitat activity than others. So when you start putting things in your yard, there's just a plethora of things to choose from. Um, I did the two displays over here. The one over on the back wall highlights the eight Audubon choices. The one on the far end just highlights a lot of different natives that are very pollinator and bird friendly. You can do a lot of assortment, but if you're only going to pick a few each year, you pick the heavy hitters. So you pick some that really do a lot in one plant. If you have an oak tree in your yard, you know, we have a lot of oaks in Florida, and people kind of take them for granted, but you know oaks are one of the most valuable trees we have. They support over 517 types of insect activity. That's a plethora of bird food. Oh my gosh. Plus, it's nesting spots. So if you have an oak tree, don't be cutting it down unless you absolutely have to. You know, keep those trees. So you want those oak trees. They are very special. And there's many kinds of oaks. So there's huge red oaks. There's nut all oaks, laurel oaks. This is just a little sampling. And they support a lot of wildlife with their nuts, too. Also, our oaks have pollen. Something's pollinating them now because our bees are all over them. You can just hear, like, I don't see them, but I mean, they're up there. And you, know, you walk by and you're kind of like looking around because those bees are active. So those oaks are very, very good for your pollinators. Um, and oaks, there's so many different sizes, so no matter what size your yard is, you can pretty much fit one in. Okay. Um, plums, oh my gosh. Plums, native plums, 448 types of insects. Who thought? Who would have known that? So there's a whole bunch of really pretty native plums. There's a Chickasaw, there's an American plum, there's a Flatwoods plum. They have beautiful white flowers in the spring great for the pollinators. Then they have this cute little fruit, and they are edible, little tart, tart on the tart side. Great, they make great preserves. Yes, great preserves. They're small. They, yeah, <laughs> exactly, jelly food. They're small, they're edible, they're tart. The wildlife loves them, the birds like them. The pollinators love the flowers. So it's a beautiful little tree. It's a great replacement for a Bradford pear. Okay, birch. If you like birch, oh my gosh, look at that back bark. Is that not exquisite? When those birch start growing and they have that exfoliating bark, it is truly a beautiful specimen in your yard. And they attract 413 different insects. So it's a wonderful tree for your yard. Crab apples, 311. Same thing. They're, they're edible for us, plus they're a little fragrant, have a little pink in the flower. Beautiful little thing. Blueberries. We covered blueberries a little bit, but blueberries attract birds. They attract 288 different types of insects. So not only are your birds enjoying the berries, they're bringing in the pollinators and in the insects, and you can eat them. Of course, the high bush are the best uh, for people, the corombosum, and then there's another one, ashii, which is like rabbit eyes and things like that. So there's blueberries that you can eat, that you can enjoy. There's little bitty blueberries, like the shiny one, teeny, teeny bitty little blueberry. The birds like them. He's littler than your fingernail, a little bitty short thing. And so then there's an Elliot, very wispy little plant, very pretty in your yard. Has a smaller blueberry, but intensely sweet. Then there's deer berries and sparkle berries, lots of things in the blueberry family. They all have that little bell, spring bell, and then they come out with fruit. Wonderful wildlife plant, easy to put in your yard. Maples, red maples, 285 types of insects. Red maples are gorgeous in the spring with that tulip seed over there, the little tulips on it. And then they're green, and then they give you a little fall color. Maple's a wonderful tree to put in your yard. Pines, don't take pines for granted. There's 203 types of insects that like them. And the sand pines is actually a larval food for some of our butterflies. So a pine's a wonderful tree to have in your yard. Some other star performers. <laughs> Look at that, palmetto. Some of you probably think they're just a weed. Oh my goodness. Palmettos only grow in three zones. We're just very fortunate to have them. And look at that, 311 types of insects. 
121 native bees use palmetto, and 21 species of butterflies. Who'd have thought? See, you don't even realize what a valuable plant it is. And it's a no-brainer. You don't have to water it. It likes wet, it likes dry, it likes sun, it likes shade. You know, I mean, it's in, hey, it's easy. You can stick a palmetto in there. Palmettos come in green, and they also come in this really pretty silver color. So you can have like a little group of green ones and a little group of silver ones. Mm, very pretty. Very easy care. You're never going to have to do anything with that palmetto. And if you have a spot where you don't have water, that's your guy. All right? Joe Pieweed. Joe Pieweed's kind of tall. He gets a, white, a pink little fluffy flower on top. Attracts three dozen species of insects and butterflies. And he's a larval food for our butterflies. Wonderful plant. Put him in the background because he's kind of tall, so you don't want him in the front. When you plant in these gardens, you kind of put the tall things in the back, shorter things in the front. And we do planting like that with you. So if you want to come, if you're at the nursery and you need assistance in planting out your yard, we do that. Okay, butterfly weed. Okay, everybody knows butterfly weed. There's a lot of different Asclepias. That's the family. Okay, so when an insect is a specialist like a monarch, he has to have Asclepius. Asclepius is butterfly weed. It doesn't just come in orange. There's other types of Asclepius, okay? He can use any Asclepius family. So he can use the orange, which is tuberosa, a little harder to work with because tuberosa is a picky plant. It either loves you or it doesn't. If it loves you, you're gonna have it every year. If it doesn't, you'll have it one year. It can be a short-lived perennial, so one word to the wise, if you've got it and it's growing, don't move it. Just be happy it's there and just love it because if you try to move it, you'll kill it. So anyway, so that, that's, and that right there is a, oh, that's not, actually, is that a monarch? He doesn't have green on him. That's actually not a, monarch has a green stripe, right? So I think that's actually a um, um, black swallowtail. Anyway, top one, this one in the middle is your pink. Your pink butterfly weed, they call it swamp, but we have discovered that you do not have to plant it in a swamp. We can plant it in a regular yard. As long as you give it water at least three times a week, give it some kind of water, it will be fine. If you plant it in a damp area, it's happy. If you put it in a garden area, it's still happy and comes back reliably. About this tall, lots and lots of leaves. And remember, if you're courting monarchs, each caterpillar eats about nine leaves. So if you put one plant in, you're not really helping because if the monarch comes over and lays his eggs there, then the babies can't, the caterpillars can't grow up and mature because there's not enough leaves for them to eat. So if you decide you want to court monarchs, put more than one in, at least five or seven. Don't have to be the same kind. You don't have to have all one type, but you do have to have more than one plant. Asclepius perennis, that's the aquatic white, and that's another one that does not have to be in the water. Although it's named aquatic, we just call it white because it does very well in a regular setting, garden setting with some water two or three times a week. It is one of the fastest to refoliate. Is the caterpillars come in at this season, like we've already had the swallowtails come in and eat ours. It gets its leaf back two and three times a year, sometimes four if we have a mild winter. And so it will support one group of caterpillars, which is a different species than the monarchs. Monarchs come through and it's back up and ready for the monarchs. So it's a great little plant. Not as big, it's a little smaller. And it has a, he's not as, quite as many leaves. But that's the one that has the more of the cardinaloids, that nasty tasting chemical. Of course, the birds don't like that. <laughs> so for birders, you have to weigh that out with your supporting your monarchs or your birds, because they don't like that, the chemicals that that one produces. This one is the non-native Mexican milkweed, Asclepius curasavica. Many of you have it. There's been a lot of discussion on whether that's good or bad. It's really not a bad plant. It's just that it can harbor bacteria in the fall. So where our native milkweeds will go back and be dormant in the fall, this one might keep on living. So the recommendation is around Thanksgiving, you cut it down to about two inches. It'll come back. It won't kill it and that way you eliminate that bacteria for your monarchs. But it does produce a lot of leaves, and it is quite prolific. And you can blend it with these. They, don't, they do not hybridize each other. 
They all can grow right next to each other, and they stay just how they are. Okay, these are your top eight Audubon picks. Let's talk about them. Buttonbush, very attractive to butterflies, but it does like a damper area. So if you have a damp area, the butterfly bush is a, I mean the button bush is a great choice. But the button bush, if it's in a regular yard, will need to be watered. So it needs to either be where you have the irrigation, or you have to get out there with a bucket and give it some water once in a while. So very nice bush. Butterfly weed's the next one, which we just discussed. Virginia creeper, we touched on that earlier. It is an important source of bird food. But keep in mind, it can be aggressive. Elderberry. Elderberry is a great plant. It grows naturally in damp areas, but it grows just as well in a garden setting too. And it has a big scape of berries. Attractive to pollinators in the spring with these flowers, the berries are a wonderful source of food for your birds. Elderberry is a great plant to grow and very, very easy, no care type of plant. It does like to be watered. Um, coneflowers. Coneflowers. Our native coneflowers are a little different than a lot of the cultivars you find in the store. A lot of the cultivars are short and more compact. Our native one is real tall. He's got, he's down here and he'll stand up, his, his stem will come up, up that high and be up here. So it's a little different type of plant, but it comes back reliably every year. The hummingbirds like it and the birds love the seeds. That's one in the winter, leaves their seed heads up because they form a little cone and that cone is packed with seeds for the birds. They, they look almost like a little sunflower, a peeled, I mean a shelled sunflower seed, all tucked into a little cone. The birds really like them. Sunflowers. There's a lot of native sunflowers. There's swamp sunflowers, there's beet sunflowers, there's a whole bunch of sunflowers. And they all have wonderful seeds for our berries, I mean birds, and they're very attractive to our pollinators. Coral honeysuckle, beautiful. Gorgeous plant, attracts your hummingbirds, and attracts a lot of different little insects and pollinators. So you can see where this is going. You're gonna to try to put plants in your yard there, you're gonna make your, your yard alive. That's the whole thing. You don't want a sterile environment for your birds. The birds need the insects, the insects need the plants. The insects are specific many times to Florida type plants. So when you look at your landscape and you have something die, Put something in it that meet, that's going to count. Put something in it that's going to attract a pollinator, that's going to attract a butterfly, that's going to feed a bird. So you can, you can change your yard with just a little tweaking, just a little tweaking, and you can really make it count for something. And you're going to see a huge difference. You will see butterflies come in. You'll see birds flying around. It's just going to be remarkable. And it's just such an enjoyment. OK, if you haven't read this book, this book is fantastic, Bring in Nature Home by Doug Talman. It, if you, when you read this, you cannot help but get excited. All of a sudden, you're gonna want out and just gonna plant stuff. You're gonna, <laughs> it's just like unbelievable. He has, it's very, very well written, well written. You'll all of a sudden read that and you're gonna just have to go out and put natives in your plant, in your yard. Now, I will say one thing. Some of you have some natives that you're growing in your yard and you think, oh, these are weeds and you pull them out. You know, spiderwort, violets. Violets are actually a um, larva food for the variegated gulf fritillary. Spiderwort brings little pollinators in it this time of year. There's many little native things growing in your yard or in your area you probably haven't really thought about. And sometimes if they pop up in your lawn and you try to get them out of there and you kill them, you can just move them into an area and mass them up. So like if you take spiderwort and do a nice little mass of spiderwort, oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. Mix it with some yarrow, it is just phenomenally beautiful. Take those violets, pop them out of the ground, put them all under your plants. They make the one most wonderful uh, ground cover and they'll keep your weeds down. I've got them in some of my perennial beds underneath other things. Quite pretty and they're evergreen. So you can make use of some of the things that you would never think of that are actually very productive in your yard. How am I on time, I'm about out? Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Does anybody have any questions? One question. Okay. The name of your nursery? Uh, Seven Pines Native Plant Nursery. And I have some cards over there. And so if any, and there's a list of um, things that we carry. Sorry. Yes, sir.
not good. Yeah, and pesticides <laughs> not good. are not good. Yeah. Anytime you're putting pesticides on anything that's going to have a fruit, is it's harmful to our insects and harmful to our birds. So, all right. Yes, ma'am. Both. That 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 had sunflower, sun plants, and shade plants. And over there, there's sun plants and shade plants. And I'll be glad to answer more questions. Yeah. Yeah, she'll be, we'll have a short break. That I'm she sorry. Answer some more questions. Oh, no problem. That was great. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Yes, awesome. Okay. Awesome. Okay. awesome. No, that's awesome. Hey, I also wanted to say that uh, during the break, the book she mentioned there, Bringing Nature Home, is for sale here um, over um, at this table, and it's 20% off of the list price. So if y'all are, it's an awesome book. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, um, we're going to change to our next speaker, and Julie. This is uh, Julie McConnell is going to um, give us our next talk. And Julie is our Bay County Horticultural a Agent. And we are really, really fortunate to have Julie here. Uh, she's awesome. And uh, I'm also a Master Gardener, so I get to support Julie and, um, uh, in doing different things. Um, Julie has a bachelor's degree in horticultural, horticulture from Auburn. Uh, <laughs> but then she saw the light and she got her uh, a master's degree in entomology from the University of Florida. So she's going to talk to us about um, great plants that you can plant here in Bay County or here in the Panhandle. So we had a question about plants for sun and shade. So she's going to deal with uh, some of those questions on some, some good plants and where they will thrive in your yard. And before we do that, just real quick, let's draw some door prizes. Okay, Daryl, I'm putting you at work again. Uh, coral honey, these are a few that Dara mentioned. The coral honeysuckle, great one for hummingbirds. That goes to number 947. 947? Yay, all right, we have a winner over there. The next one, this one is a beautiful wildflower. This is our columbine. And, oh, look at this, the flower is beautiful on this one. Another one that the hummingbirds love. This goes to 012, yay, enjoy, that's a beauty. All right, next one here, we've got a Beauty Berry. This guy has bright purple berries on it that the birds love. Mockingbirds and such will just love on this. Um, 965. 965. Yay, Rennie. All right, enjoy. And here we have. Dun, 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 dun. What do we have? Oh, one of my most favorite native wildflowers. This is an Indian pink. This is one that does great in the shade conditions and it opens red and then it opens into a yellow star that's beautiful and this goes to 031. All right, Anne, enjoy that. Okay, we have a birdhouse here for bluebirds. This was donated by Al, wherever Al is. Um, uh, th this goes to 009, all right, enjoy. Good luck with having bluebirds come by. And then we have an elderberry. And the elderberry here will be a shrub that has berries on the top and uh, very attractive for the birds. And this goes to 981. 981? All right, excellent. Well, great. And. Um, Last one for this time is a swamp hibiscus. And this is a wildflower that gets to be like six feet tall or so and has big, beautiful red flowers that are gorgeous. And this goes to 985. 985. Going once, twice. Next one, draw again. 889. All right, your winner. That's a great wildflower. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Julie. Okay. Can y'all hear me? No. I don't think it's on. Oh, wait. There we go. Do they flip my switch or do I? Let's 
need to move it up. Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Julie McConnell, and I am with the University of Florida ISIS Extension in Bay County. It's a joint position, so I am University of Florida faculty and also employed by Bay County. My office is here in the old Cedar Grove City Hall. And um, just to kind of explain very briefly, uh, we have extension offices in all 67 counties of the state. And we are here in place to help bring the research information from the university to the public and give it to you in a way that's practical. And so we do workshops, field trips, uh, we write for newspapers, newsletters, uh, and then we work with people one-on-one. -on -one, okay? Here in Bay County, we have four program areas. We have Family and Consumer Science, which is Dr. Marjorie Moore. We have 4-H, which is Youth Development, which is Dr. Paula uh, Davis. We have Sea Grant, which is Scott Jackson, so he deals a lot with marine issues. And then I am horticulture. So I am plants and bugs and dirt and all that good stuff. So, um, and Dara mentioned a lot of this stuff, um, and I think it's really important, you know, to know what is a native plant. And, you know, she gave a really good timeline of what we consider it, and it's basically before the European settlers. And exotic species are not native on the continent where they're uh, currently found, okay? And this is a picture here of swamp sunflower, the Helianthus angustifolia, and it is native to the southeastern United States. Um, a nice resource that I found that if you're interested in finding out what, if a plant is considered native to our area is you can go to the USDA uh, NRCS website, and this is the website here, the uh, plants.usda.gov, and you can look up species and they have these great interactive maps where you can actually zoom in where you can see the counties. So this is for that um, swamp sunflower, and you can see that you know, Bay County is one of the counties where it is considered a native plant. Now sometimes with, with these types of maps, they may be missing information, and that may be because they just haven't had, um, the, they just don't have the data in there where the plant is. So, you know, just say you find a plant and you think, oh, I'm pretty sure this is what it is, but it's not showing up on the map, um, you know, contact our office or, you know, USDA, and it may be that they just don't have a, a specimen of it. So, anyways, but I thought that was kind of a neat thing if you're really interested in, in like, really down and dirty native ranges. You know, is it really from, like, not just the state of Florida, but what part of Florida? Okay. So, I'm going to talk about some specific trees. Um, and plants, I'm going to kind of start big and go down, and then um, Jody's going to be talking a little bit more about design concepts and stuff because she's just a master at that. Um, but one of the things I want to start with is start with kind of your big trees, so your specimen trees or your canopy trees. And so these are the ones that are going to give a lot of shelter and nesting sites, insects for birds to eat. You know, they may have fruit or berries or nuts that insects eat also, or I'm sorry, that birds eat. Um, but they also provide shade for understory plants. So we'll talk about understory trees or some shrubs that need shade, and then of course we tend to enjoy the shade of trees here in Florida. Just a little bit. One thing you want to make sure that you do is give them space. Um, you want to make sure that you give them, you know, we know they're going to be tall. So when you go to plant a tree, you need to look in all directions. Okay, look up. Don't plant it under power lines or under the, the eave of your roof. You know, look to the left, look to the right, and of course you should always go get with the land line locators and look down, so to speak, to make sure you're not going to impact any utility services. But a good rule of thumb, if you don't know how big a plant is going to get, a lot of times you can find height information or maybe you see them in landscapes and you kind of say, okay, well, I realize that that's going to be, you know, 40 feet tall, 50 feet tall, 100 feet tall, is with your large trees, just a general rule of thumb, and plants break rules all the time, is a third to a half of the mature height is your canopy spread. If you get something like a live oak and it's as wide as it is tall or wider than it is tall, so it isn't always hold true, but it's kind of a good rule of thumb with a lot of our trees and shrubs. Our specimen trees or the canopy trees are going to take full sun. That doesn't mean that they won't grow in an area that's shady, but these are usually the ones that are going to be kind of your, you know, your focal point. This is something that's going to give shade to your yard, um, and you want to give it enough space that it can can grow and expand. Another thing is that the natural habitat where it's found is a really good clue about what kind of site it takes. We have some things that like high and dry sites. We have things that grow in low and wet sites, and then things that are salt tolerant. And if you're fortunate enough to live along the bay or the ocean, you know, salt tolerance is going to be pretty important to you. Um, 
One of the, the stories that I, I really liked, uh, Dr. Harry Ponder at Auburn University taught tree class when I was um, there. He just retired this past year. And we learned um, one of the trees that we did is, was the post oak, which is a native oak in Alabama and also a little bit here in Florida. And one of the things, and I'll never forget this, he talked about the, the trees would always, or they found them on these old cemeteries, churches, and stuff, you'd find these just majestic oak trees. They were really, really huge and really, really beautiful. And it, what it was was when people settled in the area, they realized that those were the high and dry sites. And so they would build their churches and they would have their cemeteries in those areas that were not going to flood. And so I'll always remember that post oak is high, dry sites. So it's just kind of one of those things that sticks with you. So I'm going to talk about a handful of trees um, and a handful of shrubs and a handful of perennials before we move on to uh, Jody. So river birch, Dara mentioned this. This is a native tree that is usually found along stream banks and river banks. So do you think that it needs a high dry site? Do you think it needs to be in a parking lot island surrounded by concrete? <laughs> Probably not going to be really happy. This is a, a tree that really does well in wet sites. And if you have it in your landscape, that you can have it in your landscape, it may need some water if we're not getting enough rainfall. Okay? Any plant, when you plant it, is going to have to have water until it's established. But there are some that are going to maybe have a little bit higher water requirements. So that's not to say that this needs a whole lot of water. But if, it's, if you have one that's struggling, that might be an indication that it's not getting water enough. Um, another thing is that it does like acidic soil. So sometimes we see a lot of yellowing on the foliage if the pH is too high. And here in Bay County, our pH can be really acidic. It can be really alkaline. So it can be all over the board. So that's something um, that it really likes. It's like kind of those wet areas with a low pH. But you get lots and lots of insects in that peeling bark. It's a great place for them to hide, and the, the birds can, can get them out of there. Um, they also have some seeds that are enjoyed by birds. Oak species. Uh, again, you know, there are a lot of different types, and you, we have um, some are evergreen, which means they're going to, that doesn't mean they don't drop their leaves. So there's not going to be a tree that you can plant that you're never going to have leaves that fall, okay? It just means that they don't all turn at the same time and drop at the same time. They just kind of come off as the, the leaves age, and it's usually not just this huge, you know, mass of leaves that come off at once. So um, they always tend to have some green foliage on them unless there's some kind of issue going on. So we have those evergreen oaks. Then we also have some that are semi-evergreen. So they usually hold all their leaves, but sometimes they kind of get thin if we have like a really cold winter. I saw quite a few oaks this year that, you know, have held their leaves through the last couple of winters, and then this year they said, uh-uh, it's too much, so they dropped them. And they'll be fine. They'll flush out. They just you know, look a little different to me right now because I'm used to them holding their leaves. And then we have some that are truly deciduous. And deciduous trees, we know that they are supposed to drop all their, all their foliage. Of course, here, when we have mild winter, some of our plants that are supposed to be deciduous don't drop their leaves. But they usually look pretty tired, and you kind of wish they would because they just don't look good. <laughs> so, so we have a lot of different uh, types of oaks, and so you, you know, can have some that are going to have different uh, mature heights, although I pretty much figure on most of them are going to be at least 40 feet tall. There are some that grow smaller, but they're kind of difficult to find in the trade. Don't, do you get have blackjack oak or some of those smaller ones that, that do stay small? You do have some of those available? Okay, so you know where to go to get some of the smaller growing oak trees. Um, but a lot of them are going to get very, very large. Maples. We have um, the red maple, and we also have the southern sugar maple that perform pretty well in this area. And, you know, figure on those being 50 feet or bigger. Again, this is a tree that we find in kind of low, wet areas naturally, so they can tolerate some amount of flooding. That's not to say that they have to have it. Um, one complaint I hear a lot of people say about red maples is about the roots coming up, and sometimes that does happen. So that's something that you just want to consider is give them enough soil area that if the roots do come somewhat to the surface that it's not going to be a problem for you. Um, you know, we don't want to hem them in with concrete paths and sidewalks, and we really don't want to do that to any trees. It's not beneficial to them at all. Um, but that is, that is one complaint that we sometimes hear. But the trees are really gorgeous. They flower before the leaves come on, and we get those, you know, the beautiful samaras that 
that um, are pictured up here. We have nesting in them. And, you know, if we have the right kind of conditions in the fall, some of them have some really nice fall color. Uh, the southern sugar maple also, if you're from up north and you're used to the sugar maples with all that beautiful gold and orange, our southern sugars aren't quite that showy, but you don't want to try to, to use a northern sugar maple down here. It's just not going to perform well. It's way too hot. But we do have the southern sugar, so it has that similar leaf shape. It's just smaller, and they are, you know, they're native here, so they're accustomed to our climate. Southern magnolia. So this, I love southern magnolias. And this, this picture here has um, what we call skirts up. So it's limbed up from the bottom. If you're one of those people that hates to see all the leaves on the ground or the magnolia tree, your simple solution is don't limb it up. It will be full all the way to the ground like a Christmas tree, like a southern Christmas tree, right? And it would hide all those leaves that fall down, and then you don't have to pick them up. You can just let them stay underneath the tree, and you'd have all kind of insects and whatnot living under there, and everybody would be happy, and you just pretend. So skirt down if you don't want to pick up leaves. Um, the, the flowers, of course, are really fragrant. The seeds are eaten. You know, always kind of see a lot of birds nesting around them, and we get insects on them. So again, the birds are eating the insects. And they, they do get big. And Little Gem is a cultivar that they stay smaller, but really it's just a slower growing tree. So it doesn't get big as fast. So it, you, do, you can put it in a smaller yard, but still you want to make sure that you've got room for it to get nice and fat and full. Um, Bracken's Brown Beauty is a, a one that uh, does get large, but it's got a whole lot of that uh, brown. The, anyone ever notice? how it's fuzzy on the underside of a southern magnolia leaf. So the Bracken's brown was kind of selected because it's so dark. It's a really nice contrast. Um, and anybody in here watch a certain show where they do these beautiful makeovers on homes and they always put a magnolia in? I love that show, but it drives me insane that they put a magnolia three feet from the house. Okay? <laughs> it is going to get... 15 feet wide at the smallest. Usually they're going to get more like 20, 30 feet wide. So please don't do that. And if you're living in a house and you could drive home tonight, well, it'll be dark in the morning, you look outside and you realize, I've got a magnolia five feet from my house, you might want to move it next winter. <laughs> Actually, you can move them in the summertime, but you've got to water them really good. And they'll shock and drop leaves, but they're pretty tough. So uh, we're going to move on to kind of small trees and shrubs. And if I have on there that it's an understory tree, that means that it's naturally kind of in that filtered light under these, these other canopies, okay? So that's not to say you can't put them in full sun, but if you've ever put something like a dogwood or a redbud, redbud out in full sun and then it looks like someone took a blowtorch to it, it's because it really wants to be under, you know, pine shade or the oak shade or have some kind of protection from that glaring sun because naturally in the woods, if you're ever out hiking and you see them, they're not these perfect little lollipops of trees. They've got these, you know, gorgeous horizontal branches and they're just kind of reaching this way and that and, you know, they, they really need some shelter from that direct glaring sun. Um, and, and especially, you know, we've got this sandy soil and it's a lot of them because they're supposed to be under that canopy you know, they're used to soils that have higher organic matter because you've got that leaf litter falling from those trees that are providing shade. And so even though we don't have a lot of good organic matter in our soil in Florida, there is still some in some situations. So if you take that tree and you plant it in the sun, in the sand, it's probably not going to be very happy, okay? Um, but the red buds are gorgeous. They bloom with these um, pink flowers. There are some white flowering types, too. But um, normally you see this kind of pinkish purple color. They have heart-shaped leaves. Um, they're, they're in the legume family, so they have long bead pods on them. If anyone's ever seen that, it's kind of neat. And there are some um, red leaf varieties, like forest pansy, um, out on the market. There are actually some that are weeping and some other kind of interesting shapes, um, some that are multi-trunked and that bloom on both new and old wood. Avondale is one that I've seen that's, that's really neat. But even though they kind of like a little bit of moisture and they definitely want some shade, they can't, they don't sit in water well. So if you're overwatering them, you can cause a problem that way too. 
These have been blooming lately. Has anyone noticed these? They have been fabulous this year. So American fringe tree or Grancy graybeard, that's um, another name for it. I don't know, I don't hear that too much down here in Georgia, I heard that a lot. But these, they can be single stem or multi-trunk. And a lot of times they're kind of bush form. They might even just look like a big bush in somebody's yard. And right now they're just really, really showy. Uh, I mean, it's the kind where you kind of, you slow down. I mean, you just have to look and go, what is that? Um, but they have these little um, fringy looking flowers. And that's why they call it fringe flower. And if you're familiar with um, the shrubs Lorapedlum, it's, it's not the same thing, but the flowers look the same. And so that's why some people call that fringe flower. But this is, this is the original fringe tree. So um, there is an American one, that, which is what this is. There is also a Chinese one that you might see um, available too. Uh, but this one, you know, it's not a very large growing tree. Usually about 20, 25 feet is, is usually about as big as, as we see them, but they do get wide. So you want to give them some room. And um, they have a, a blue-black fruit that's eaten by birds and other animals in the fall. Hollies. We have lots and lots of different hollies. One thing that is kind of interesting that not everybody realizes is that we do have male and female hollies. And so the females are going to have berries. And so sometimes we, um, what they'll do is they'll usually kind of select some that are going to be good uh, berry producers. And that's what you're going to see on the market and most available. And um, there are some that have um, red berries is what we, tip, we see a lot of, but there are some that also have dark colored berries and we have some uh, that are also deciduous. So there are a lot of native hollies that drop their leaves too and um, don't necessarily get really big. These that we listed here, the Dahoon, Savannah, and Yopon, those all get really big and they're kind of more like tree hollies, but we have some shrub ones too. Um, there are a lot of um, shrub hollies that are not native though that you see available in stores. So usually most of the shrubs are going to be either um, something off of a, a yopon, which would be a native, or some of our deciduous ones. Wax myrtle. This is a tough plant. A lot of people don't care for it. They think it looks kind of weedy and stuff. But if you, if you take the time to prune it, you can do a lot of things with it. Um, it can be just left full to the ground and shrubby, or you can limb it up like this photo here. Um, and, that one, actually, that one I got from you. A lot of my photos Jody took. She is a fantastic photographer. And I don't know if you noticed that as we were going through. Uh, there's, there's some wax myrtles out here in this rooftop garden. And I think, did you bring some wax myrtle? Oh, OK. Um, it has a really fragrant foliage. So like if you crush the foliage, you can smell it. And the berries that the birds will eat and other animals will eat, they use to make bayberry candles. So it, you know, it's something that's been around for a really long time and, and really something that was useful to, to people. Um, but the foliage is a good shelter site for, for nesting birds. And um, wax myrtles will grow just about anywhere. They'll take wet sites. They'll take dry sites. They will tolerate salt spray, um, full sun, down to full shade. So really, really, really tough plant. Beauty berries. I think somebody just got a beauty berry, didn't they? Yeah. So the beauty berry, that's a deciduous shrub. And it really performs, it does better with a little bit of, um, of shade, although I have seen some growing in full sun. They look a little unhappy by about August, but they're really, really versatile. Uh, so they're deciduous, meaning they're going to lose their leaves in the wintertime if we have cold enough temperatures. But they can get a lot of size to them. They can get six foot by six foot pretty easily. In the spring, they'll have tiny little purple flowers, or if it's a white variety, it may have white flowers that are just all along like the leaf axils. And in the fall, you get a lot of berries. And the berries, of course, are really enjoyed by the, by the birds. Darrow's blueberry. So this is one that is native, and it's evergreen. Um, most of our other, well, I guess here, the blueberries tend to hold their leaves pretty well. Up in northern climates, they do drop their leaves. Um, but this is one that is really kind of more ornamental. I mean, you, you could eat the berries, but I've heard they're not very tasty for people, so I wouldn't recommend it. I'd stick more to the rabbit eye and the high bush if you're going to have it for yourself. But this is um, very closely related to the ones that we eat. And again, it likes acidic soil. It needs well-drained soil, but it's not going to like it really, really dry. Part shade to sun. 
um, and it can uh, spread by suckers. So it can kind of colonize an area. So say you have an area that is, you know, kind of moist and, you know, you really don't want to buy a whole lot of plants. This one is one that can spread and kind of fill in that area for you. And the foliage, you can't really tell in the picture, but it's got kind of this, this like bluish tone to it. So it's a really unusual color in the garden that, that contrasts nicely with some other things. Here we go with the palmetto again. Okay. <laughs> you know, sometimes we really beat ourselves up with unrealistic expectations. And sometimes we work really hard at things that we shouldn't. And so if you don't like this plant, you don't have to go buy it, okay? But if you have it already and you have been fighting it and fighting it and fighting it, maybe you just need to go, you know what? The birds love this plant. It is indestructible. And, you know, look at all the benefit it has. The birds eat the fruit. The hummingbirds visit the flowers. It's nesting site, it's salt tolerant, it's drought tolerant, it takes sun or shade and whatever. Okay, so just give it up, okay? <laughs> and, they, and they can look really nice. I mean, this picture here where, you know, it's in the landscape, it doesn't have to look bad. Now, if it's growing up inside your Indian hawthorn, maybe just pull out the Indian hawthorn and give it, and just let it go. <laughs> just, just a suggestion. Okay, so I'm going to move on to herbaceous plants and, and just touch on a few briefly. Um, blanket flowers, so that's the, the more orangey one in the background. I was trying to cram more stuff on less slides. So that's Gallardia. Um, sunny, dry sites goes really well in those, those sandy, hot places that everything else just looks like you're burning it up. Um, Black-eyed Susan, it likes it a little bit less hostile, so to say, but um, it's a pretty tough plant, but you know, it's a little bit more full sun to part shade. Um, it prefers a little bit more organic matter in the soil, but it'll tolerate some pretty rough sites. Uh, Coreopsis, so just the genus Coreopsis in general, there's a whole bunch of different types. There are some that are perennial, there are some that are annual, um, and actually, um, one of the Coreopsis is uh, a state, that's considered the state wildflower. I don't think they picked a particular one, or did they? Yeah, just, yeah, they just went with all of them because they're just so fantastic. And de depending on which type, we have some that will bloom in the spring, some in the summer, a lot of them in the fall. So a lot of times we'll get calls at the office and they'll be like, what is that yellow thing blooming on the side of the road? And, and a lot of times it's like swamp sunflower or the Coreopsis that really give a lot of, um, a lot of color later in the season when everything else is looking kind of weak. Um, but they have the, the little, um, the common name is chick seed. It has a really small seed, but a lot of birds uh, will feed on that. Purple cone flower. This is one that's really easy to grow. And actually, um, so is the, uh, the black-eyed Susan from seed. So if you don't want to buy transplants and you want to put seeds out, these, these usually come up pretty easily. Um, they're pretty easy to find. Most of our purple cone flower are going to be kind of a pink or lavender color. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different things on the market where they've done a lot of um, crossing and breeding and some of the smaller ones. I personally haven't had any luck with those. I, I can kill those. I, I, well, I can kill a lot of plants, don't, don't get me wrong. But I killed those really fast and they're very expensive, so that makes me not do it twice. Um, the, the purple cone flowers, sometimes we'll have some white flowers. And I included this picture here from our butterfly garden at our office, which you really should come by and see sometime. It's, it's really beautiful. Um, we have one of our purple cone flowers in the garden that for two years it's thrown out white flowers. I don't know if it'll do it this year or not, but it's just kind of just been kind of fun to watch. And it's the same plant. It's not a separate plant. It's, it'll have purple flowers and white flowers coming out of the base of the same one. So it's kind of kind of special. Don't steal it. So <laughs> we're not fenced in. But the, the, they're really tolerant of a lot of different things. You know, sun and a little bit of shade. You don't want them in too much shade. Um, and they have the seeds for the birds, and also the hummingbirds would visit them. So uh, lots of pollinators come. I mean, we have, we have lots and lots of buds in our garden. Then nectar for hummingbirds. So I think most of us are pretty familiar that they have some favorite colors, the red, orange, or pink are preferred. And they, they like those long tubular flowers because, you know, that's how they're, they're, they need to feed. They have that long beak. 
Um, the most important time to make sure that you've got some flowers that are good nectar sources for them are from March to September, which is nesting time. So here, somebody got one of these, didn't they? The coral honeysuckle. Um, so this is a vine. A lot of times what you may find um, in your landscape, if you, the coral honeysuckle is, this particular one is native. There is a Japanese honeysuckle that's in, invasive that a lot of times we've found on properties that are really, really difficult to manage. Um, if you need help trying to ID the difference, we can help you with that. Uh, but this one is, is a good vine. It twines, which means it's going to kind of twirl around something. So if you want it to climb, you want to give it something thin that it can wrap itself around. You know, some of our vines will throw out little suckers and attach themselves to things, and some do uh, twine around things. So this one is a twiner. And um, it'll take pretty much any kind of sun conditions. And um, in addition to the flowers being attractive to the hummingbirds, it also does have a berry that the, birds, the other birds will eat. Firebush, I love this plant. Um, I live up in, in Bayou George, and so we tend to get like some pretty cold, um, we, we, get, we get the cold snaps. You know, everyone else will be kind of like, oh, it didn't frost here. And I'm like, yeah, I get frosted at my house and lost this and lost that, and this side died back. My firebush every year gets to be about four or five feet tall, and when we get a hard frost, it, it goes down, and it looks like it's dead as a hammer. And, you know, we, we'll leave it for a while, and then I'll cut it back, and so far, five years, it's come back every time. So it's probably slower coming back at my house than it would be in town or near the water, but it's definitely worth having. It is always just covered with all kinds of of bees and butterflies and the hummingbirds and everything. It's a really, really fabulous plant. Um, and it's, it's really tolerant. Where I have it, I have it in a, in a bed, full sun. It's on the west side of my house, and the bed's not irrigated. And it does great. So we watered it first, you know, through the first summer a little bit, but after that, it is tough. Scarlet sage. There are so many different types of salvias, and there are a whole bunch that are native um, to Florida and to you know, southeastern United States. There are some that are annuals, there are some that are um, perennials and that, that come back. This one here, the scarlet sage, I think, this, did you give one of those away? Yeah, yeah I thought you did. So, so this is, it's a really nice one. It'll bloom like through most of the growing season, and it will reseed, so you'll have some little babies pop up that you can share with your friends. Um, but the hummingbirds come around and, and really like it instead of the butterflies. So it's a really good one. Hot, dry spot, perfect of this. The false rosemary. This you may, if you ever visit uh, St. Andrews State Park, you're likely to see this growing out there, kind of in those areas where you think nothing could possibly grow, hot, sandy, windy, I mean, you name it, it's miserable. And here's this beautiful little silvery foliage plant with the little purple flowers. Um, it is evergreen. <clears throat> Excuse me. And like I said, it just takes a really miserable spot, and the hummingbirds like it too. But that silvery foliage is really neat because you don't see that color a whole lot. <coughs> Excuse me. So some of the benefits of using native plants, well, I think we've, we've kind of, do we make that point tonight? I think, okay. So <laughs> what, right, so... And it, it, it's not to say that you can't use other plants. I know my garden is a mix of native and, um, you know, exotic. I hate kind of even saying that. I just want to say, like, non-native rather than, but either way. I have both at my house. You know, I'm, I'm into bugs. I have them all, you know, I'm fine with them. And uh, obviously that's kind of my thing. And uh, anyhow, it, it, it's really neat to see the difference, the different insects that do come to the native plants compared to the ones that are not from around here. Um, so it, it really is, it makes a big difference. And also just the care, they're adapted to the climate, they're adapted to the soils. And even though we have insects feeding on them and, and you know, different things like that, they can handle it. You know, they can be eaten down and they'll grow back. It's like they've, you know, adapted together and it's kind of part of the cycle, what needs to happen. Um, the most important thing though is understand your site and come to terms with it and choose the plant that is appropriate for your site instead of trying to change your site to match the plant that you want to have. So. All right, and we definitely want to thank um, the uh, Coleman and Susan Burke Center for Native Plants for supporting this program. Any questions? All right, well, thank you.
All right. Okay. Uh, everybody, we're going to give away some more plants here. And so I need my, my plant bearer here. And I'm going to try to give away a few that Julie just talked about. One here, this is the Chipola um, coreopsis. This is an endangered coreopsis that's um, only found in like three states. It's federally you know, listed as endangered. It blooms in the fall. It's a really great one. So this goes to... Da, da, da. Oh, I'm supposed to read this? Oh, I have to put my glasses on. Okay. Uh, number 011. Yay. Take great care of that plant. Okay, our next one. This one right here is an elderberry. This is one that, again, has berries that the birds enjoy. And the number is 893. Dun, dun, dun. Who has 893? Yay, right here up front. Excellent. Well, good. Um, oh, I'm going to talk about a, here's a salvia. This is our live, our lyre leaf sage. And this one is uh, another one that says that the, the butterflies love. And it goes to zero, zero, zero. Yay, no one. Enjoy. And next one. Let's see. I'm going to get this one right here. And what do we have? Oh, wait, this is a car, uh, cardinal flower. This one is one likes a little moisture um, uh, soil. Has beautiful, beautiful red flowers that the um, hummingbirds enjoy. And this one goes to number 024. 024, yay. Oh, okay. Here we have a trillium. This is one of our native trilliums. These are our woodland flower and um, they have really interesting, neat little blooms, and the, f the leaves are really cool on these. Okay, this goes to 994. 994, Trillium. Yay! Awesome. You'll love that plant. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Now we have a yellow cone flower. Uh, this is the Rebecca uh, uh, Fulgida. And it's a great perennial yellow flowered um, um, Rebecca, and it goes to 002. Yay, we're good. All right. <laughs> okay, this is a Monarda. This is one that the bees really will enjoy. And this one goes to. Dun, 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 dun. We got to draw. <laughs> okay, this goes to 972. 972? Nope. Okay, snooze you lose. Okay, um, 001. Yay, <laughs> Vicky, all right. <laughs> huh. And the last one for right now, um, said we'll have two more drawings after this. This is a beach um, uh, dune sunflower. And this kind of will and we'll make like a two, three foot spreading uh, flower that has yellow flowers. It's very floriferous and it'll grow in sandy, hot conditions. And 991. 991. Yay. All right. Enjoy. Okay, we're going to take a very quick, because we're behind, 10-minute um, break, okay? A um, couple of things is that, you know, we've got book vendor here if you'd like to buy some books that are 20% off. And also that Jara will be selling the plants on the display afterwards. So if you might want to go by and see if there's any of them you'd like to buy.
Hello? Hello, everybody? Let's go ahead and start making our way back to our seats. You got everything? Okay, everybody, let's start mo meandering our way onto our seats. We're going to get started again. We have two more presentations and two more plant drawings. Ooh. So hang around. Come on over. Nope, that ain't going to work. Everybody, let's make our way over to our seats again. Okay, we're getting ready. Uh, we're, now, all of y'all, we've been uh, you, you've been told a, a, a lot about the um, decline of the birds and the importance of native plants to our bird population. Um, and that uh, we have some absolutely wonderful native plants out there for your yards. But now you're probably wondering, well, how in the world do I find these native plants and which particular ones will do well in my yard? And um, Mary Jo here is, uh, Mary Jo Capra is our next speaker. And she's a member of our Audubon Society and also our, our uh, Sweet Bay Florida Native Plant Society. And Master, Master Gardner, and, and so <laughs> three of our sponsoring organizations. And um, uh, so I just want to also, you know, say, you know, thank you. We got the Bay Conservancy back here and Gulf Coast uh, State College for hosting us in this wonderful room. Um, it's just a fantastic facility. And um, I, I just wanted also, before we start, mention that each of y'all got a little goodie bag. And um, that goodie bag has all sorts of neat stuff in there. And um, that one booklet on gardening for wildflower, that was um, compliments of the Audubon um, uh, grant um, uh, that we mentioned earlier. You also had some seeds in there. We had seeds that were donated on the Panhandle Alliance uh, Wildflower, uh, wildflower um, Foundation. And um, so those were, were donated. And we also had seeds that were donated from the Sweet Bay um, chapter of Native Plant Society. Yes, Rennie? Oh, yes. The one in the brown envelope are a combination of Coreopsis and flax, uh, phlox seeds. Mm -hmm. So a combo of phlox and Coreopsis. All right, and with that, I'm going to turn over to Mary Jo. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Louisa? <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, I, as uh, Jody said, I am Mary Jo Capra, and I am with the Bay County Audubon Society. That's my hat I'm wearing tonight. And my goal is to introduce you to the online resources for plant selection in your yard, or even in a planter box. If you don't have a yard, or you uh, just have a small patio area, planter boxes are great too. The birds and the the birds and the bees like those also. Okay, let's see if I can make this work. Okay, okay. The first site is audubon.org plants for birds. Now this site um, is uh, the plants for birds program with the Audubon Coleman and Susan Burke Center for Native Plants. To enter this native, um, native plant database, you click on the bottom of the page or you can just go to audubon.org slash native dash plants and there, you would enter your zip code. And if you want um, a list of the plants that you select emailed to you, 
they will email that to you um, there. And then you just click search right there. Okay, this will take you to uh, the page, uh, the first page that will have the best results for your area. So that, um, this one has, what, 45 best results for, for our area. And then um, down below that, there are selections for the type of plant, all plant resources, and then attracts what type of bird. By selecting the first box, um, it gives you a search for type of plant. So you can search for annuals, perennials, grasses, succulents, shrubs, trees, vines, or evergreens. I selected evergreens, um, and it's filtered for evergreen plants. And then I scrolled down the list and found live oak. And it gives a brief description of the oak tree. And it tells you what, um, it tells them your trees and that they're evergreen and they uh, are, have nuts and they attract butterflies and they hold caterpillars. So I like that one. And I put a little check mark in the box for, to add it to my plant list. So the next uh, drop down was um, the type of thing I wanted to attract. And I said, well, I want to attract caterpillars. So um, the reason I uh, selected caterpillars is, like Dara said, it is uh, one of the things, the proteins that um, birds need to feed their babies. And in fact, um, baby birds eat a whole lot. And the chickadee, whose egg is about the size of my oh, pinky finger. So that egg is uh, pinky fingertip. It's about that size. And the pair of chickadees will bring between 390 and 570 caterpillars a day to their nest. And it takes 16 days for them to fledge. So that, over that 16-day period, to feed a, a nest of chickadees, you need 9,000 caterpillars. So we need to plant a lot, a lot of oak trees. One chickadee. Yeah, this is uh, one nest of chickadees. They'll have two or three babies in the nest, but it takes a lot. Yeah, and the chickadees, are, they eat a lot. So um, the next drop-down box uh, has the types of birds. So if you have a particular type of bird that you would like to see in your yard, you can select from a general group of birds. And I selected the woodpecker. And that box um, gave me a list. And I scrolled down that list, and I found sweet gum. And um, this says tree sparkleberry with a hyphen, but it's just a plain old sparkleberry. Um, and so I like those plants, and I check those boxes there to add to my list. And then I said, well, I want to get my plant list. So I just click on that box down there at the bottom of the page that says get plant list, and it will prompt you to put your email address in it. Um, and they will email you the list from there. And then it will take you to this page. Now this is a very important page because it has your list that you selected on the page and it also has a, a, a goal. The goal of this grant program is to get a million native trees or plants planted for our birds. So they're asking us to make a commitment to how many plants that we would like, native plants that we will plant in our yard, in our zip code. And they're trying to track this, so to see how many people are actually interested in uh, increasing the habitat for our birds. So 
then, yeah, that little area there, sorry. <laughs> then if you keep scrolling down the page, you'll see that there are other resources. And it lists um, Bay County Audubon and Florida Audubon as resources. And then underneath there, it also has Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center and the Florida Native Plant Society. And then it has places where you can buy native plants like Seven Pines Nursery, so, uh, and then mail order native plants. If you, uh, so from there, I selected, I said, well, I want to see the Florida Native Plant Society webpage. So I clicked on that page. It is a wonderful website. It has all kinds of information about native plants. And if you drop, uh, click on the box, um, that says native plants, it has the drop down menu, and it has a, a um, indicator for native plants for your area. So when, uh oh, can't, yeah. So anyway, um, I don't know why that blank slide's in there, it was, couldn't get rid of it, sorry. Uh, so on this site, you can look for uh, plants in your area in two different ways. So this area up here, you can look for a specific plant. So I, um, I chose the sparkleberry. I was going to look for the sparkleberry again because I like the plant and I wanted to find out more information about it. So by um, um, entering the name and pressing the go button, it takes you to this page, which tells you um, it has a smiley face on it. And it tells you, oh, well, this is great favorite for landscaping. So this is one that you should plant in your yard. So, uh, and it gives you the scientific name and sparkleberry is the common name and then sparkleberry is another name. Um, and they said it was probably because people couldn't pronounce the name. So they started calling it sparkleberry. So if you click on the uh, scientific name, then it takes you to all this information about the plant. It tells you the life, the form, the lifespan, the size, the height, the width, the color of the flowers, the color of the fruit. It gives you all kinds of information. It tells you how you can propagate it, um, where it, that you can buy it. Um, what kind of light you need for it. So this is a partial, partial sun. And then this one, um, that graph, it tells you from um, dry to wet. So this one will go from very dry to moderately wet. Um, and it, and it's, um, it's not salt tolerant. Oh no, I might not have it in my yard. Then, but it will grow um, in sand and it likes acidic soil. And if you scroll farther down the page, it tells you uh, the kinds of um, wildlife it attracts. It's uh, the striped hair streak larval host. And then it grows in all these native areas. And then the um, map on the left, is that right? Yeah, <laughs> on the left. Uh, is the distribution for the native, where there are native plants. And the, uh, the other map is the hardiness zone, so where they grow, where they will grow well. So it's A, 8A, 8B, 9A, and 9B. And we're down here in the bottom of Bay County, we're a 9A. The Northern Bay County and the rest of the Panhandle is um, an 8B. Now, if I go back to this page, there's another way to search, and that's by your county. So you can enter the county, and um, it will bring you to a page, and then you can select what uh, you have in your yard, what kind of uh, habitat you have. Do you, are you full sun? Do you, what kind of water needs are you? Do you have a wet area? what kind of soil you have, and then 
you can select for the type of plant you want. So you want a butterfly plant or you want uh, wildlife cover, you want something that's salt tolerant. So you may, you, you look at your yard and you decide what you want and you just check these boxes and then click on get list and it brings you a list of all the native plants by the type, by tree, by shrub, by flower, um, vines and uh, that are in your area and of course the green highlighted uh, scientific names if you click on those, they will take you to that detailed information that um, I showed you on the previous slide. Okay, now, if you really, really, really want more information, um, we can go to the EDIS IFAS UFL EDU um, webpage. Now this, um, the EDIS, Hold, please. <laughs> um, is, is the Everyday Information Resource. It is a comprehensive single repository of all the current UF IFAS numbered peer reviewed publications. So, once again, I selected Barkleberry and I hit the go button, and within point one four seconds, it brought up 19 publications about sparkleberry. So that means the name was listed in them. They're not all detailed, but there was something in each one of those articles about a sparkleberry. So the sparkleberry, um, if you, um, I selected the first one, and it brings me to a page that has more detailed information about the sparkleberry. And you can also click the uh, download PDF and it will um, make a PDF uh, file that you can save on your computer or print in a reasonable, that's a beautiful document. So, that's it. That's all I have to say. Great, Great. there you go. Any questions, real quick question? Any All right, thank you. All a right. wealth of information is out there, and I mean, this is just so awesome to have all that at your computer. All right, um, thank you, Mary Jo, and um, we're going to give away a few plants here, and then I'll be the last speaker. Thank you. Great. All right, Melissa. Okay, our first plant is a dune sunflower. And this one has uh, yellow flowers and um, um, a really great um, blooms all summer long. And then this goes to, I have to put glasses on again, 992. 992? Okay, all right. Oh, did we lose Daryl? <laughs> Thank you. Our next one here is a, a prairie cone flower. And this is a beautiful perennial, and it goes to dun, dun, dun. nine five zero. Nine five zero. Yay, we're good. Our next one is a red buckeye. If y'all have ever seen a red buckeye, it's a beautiful, beautiful understory tree with red flowers, and they're gorgeous. And uh, it goes to zero, zero, 006. <laughs> Woo, very good. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. Our next one goes to, ooh, 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 yellow ironweed. Ooh, most ironweed is purple. This is, this is very cool. This is a special one. Zero, two, six. Oh, Charles, awesome. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Oh, Scutellaria or a school cap. These have purple flowers. Um, really nice um, perennial. 033. Oh, yay. <laughs> Good. All right. Next one is a spotted horse mint, dotted horse mint. 
This is our native Menarda again, and butterflies love this, and it goes to 996. 996, over there, yay. Ooh, we got a golden zizia. This is a host plant for our black swallowtail butterfly. And uh, this is an awesome one you don't find often. That's upside down. Oops, there we are. 953. <laughs> Yay. Oh, you'll love that. It's a great one. And here we have, ooh, another great one. This is the rhododendron canensis, one of our native azaleas. This is the pink flowering one. And it goes to 037. Ooh, yay. Congratulations. And one more. And then we'll have one last drawing after my presentation. This is one of our native um, goldenrods. And I think it, see, I'm, I'm not sure which one, but 984. Goldenrod? Oh, yay. Congratulations. We're running Lorna here now. <laughs> All right. And with that, I am your last speaker. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to try to pull everything together from today and um, pull it all together into one summary here. And um, I'm going to actually focus on how you can put everything that you learned today and you can take it and you can apply it to your yard, to your home garden. The key here for attacking birds to your home garden is to provide them what they need, and that is food, water, and shelter. So if you can provide those things, they will come. And the key thing and the big summary of what I want you to take away from this is that in order to attract the most birds and the most number of species of birds is that you need to plant a diversity of plants. Uh, preferably a lot of native plants, and that's what will give you the, the greatest uh, range of, um, of uh, birds. So you need, for food, you need to have this, in, uh, be able to feed this little baby mockingbird, you need to have insects. And for insects, what you need are native plants. So you have to have a native plant. You also, um, for a permanent residence, um, once again, in addition to the birds, just the native, you know, just the, or the babies, uh, for the birds themselves, a variety of native plants, again, the seeds, nuts, berries, fruits, and things will attract these birds to your yard. And of course, the associated insects and caterpillars which come with those plants. We have uh, winter migrants that come in. Um, some of these like the cedar waxwings and such, and uh, being able to plant things like the hollies that have berries that they will love um, or, or things that you can do in your yard to, to help them. Um, consider also um, supplementing um, the birds with feeders. Um, that's something that you can do. Um, uh, yeah, there's different types of feeders that different birds will co go to. Um, and um, uh, you'll, you'll want to research them and what type of foods and such. If you do have feeders, though, please locate them like 10 to 15 feet away from shrubs so that you don't have predators being able to get them while, you know, you don't want it to be a nice little hunting ground for the birds there. So plant them away from the shrubs there a little bit and keep the feeder clean, you know, um, so that uh, you don't spread disease. Um, key, though, is native plants, you know, they're, they're native things, but this is something that you can bring to your home. Um, water. Consider adding a water feature to your yard. There are a lot of different ways you can do that. You can have uh, extensive ones like they're shown in the two bottom picture. Then you could also just have a bird bath. And uh, it's great watching these birds when they, uh, they bathe, uh, like this, this bluebird in this picture. Cover is very, very important. 
And it's cover for nesting, it's cover for protection from the elements, it's cover for protection from predators. And having different bushes of different thicknesses of um, a density of, of, of foliage, um, different heights, different birds like uh, different size nests, uh, different materials. You know, some like to be very low to the ground in, in low shrubs. Some of them like to be high up into the trees, up into the canopy. So having a diversity of plants in your yard will attract the greatest number of birds to come to your yard. Uh, consider leaving snags. Y'all like woodpeckers? What a snag is is a dead tree. Um, if, if, there's, if you have a tree that's, um, that's dead, um, but it's not in a place that it's going to fall and, and um, hurt something, um, consider leaving it because that's somewhere that it, it, yeah, that dead uh, wood will attract insects that the uh, woodpeckers then will feed on. And so it, it once again brings the birds to your yard. Consider uh, adding a nesting box like this uh, blueberry um, um, box here, um, or bluebird. bluebird. Um, we gave away one of those earlier. Um, that's something that uh, if you have an a area that has a, a nice lawn, uh, they like to have a little bit of an open area for bluebirds in addition to have some shrubbery. Um, uh, consider varying the type of habitat you have in your yard. Um, have some flat areas, shrub areas, some, some higher tree areas. Um, minimize the use of pesticides. We've mentioned this several times in the evening. Uh, protect um, your birds from uh, um, cats and dogs. Um, they, you know, cats can kill hundreds of millions of birds every year. Hummingbirds. A lot of people really would like to attract hummingbirds. They're beautiful um, to attract them. Uh, planting plants that have a variety of tubular flowers that bloom over a long period of time is something that you can do to attract them. Coral honeysuckle that was mentioned earlier and uh, several of the other flow um, flowers that were mentioned. Um, they prefer orange red flowers generally, but they go for other colored flowers. Um, as was mentioned earlier, almost half of their, um, of, of their food, though, that they eat are insects. It's not just nectar. And so having the native plants that support those insects are important. Uh, you may also want to consider an artificial feeder to bring it to your home. Uh, we all look, love looking at hummingbirds. Um, if you do do that, though, consider just a four-part water to one-part sugar solution without the red dye. You don't need that red dye and uh, it actually can, can cause some harm to, to the hummingbird, so don't put that in there. Um, and make sure that, you, once again, that you clean it every four or five days or so, so that uh, bacteria doesn't have a chance to grow and cause problems. Um, water, once again, important thing, you can provide a clean water source. Small bird bath is all you need there. Cover for them, um, just plants of variable, variable height, and for the insects, let's limit the pesticides. Components for a successful garden. In summary, then, is a wide variety of native plant species. Um, it is best if you use plant species that grow somewhere near you. You know, if you have, um, um, like St. Andrew State Park, you know, you have um, palm trees growing there, or comradina, or other things like that. The insects and things that feed on those are likely to be in your area, and you're, you want to bring them into your yard also. So consider things that are growing around you to have the best chance of success. Um, consider supporting things all year long, and uh, like for instance on um, butterflies and um, with the hummingbirds and such, having things that bloom for long periods of time. Well, one way to do that is not having something that blooms for a long period of time because it doesn't seem to be. There's not that many things that will do that but plant a variety of things that over that time period will cover um, that breadth of time with blooms. Um, plants of varying heights are important and having other structures like water features and brush piles and tree snags there. Uh, designing your home garden. When you're wanting to design your garden, you need to consider what your goals are. Uh, are they to attract birds? I'm assuming most of y'all would be interested in attracting birds, and we're giving you a lot of key info on how to go about doing that. If you're interested in attracting butterflies or bees, a lot of the same things that we're talking about for birds are exactly what you need to do for them also. So and you can have a two-for-one there or a three-for-one, whatever, and uh, if those are your goals also. 
uh, nature, native plants create relaxation, uh, beauty and interest. If one of your goals is to create privacy, you may want to consider adding evergreens. Like if you have a neighbor you can't stand, put a wall of <laughs> evergreen hollies in between yeah. y'all, you know? <laughs> the ones with the, yes, the ones with the stickers. <laughs> And add some yucca in there, and Spanish bayonet, and some coral beans. There you, go. <laughs> um, you may want to have a flower garden, and we have so many wonderful perennials. You may want an edible garden. We have edible plums and uh, blueberries. We've, we've named several things that are edible that uh, you can add to your garden. Uh, you may want to have a play area, and you may want to have an expansive yard for that. But consider adding borders and edge, you know, around the edge of that, the native plants and things for the wildlife and the birds. So consider this, you know, what, what are your goals when you're designing your garden? Now, as a couple of people have said, you don't have to dig up your whole entire garden and, you know, say nothing but non-native. <laughs> That's not what we're, we're saying you have to do. Um, but first thing is um, something we haven't dealt too much on is uh, that you really ought to consider getting rid of invasive plants. And these are plants that are um, uh, non-native plants that are, you know, taking over our, our native plant communities, essentially. Um, they either um, uh, alter the plant community, sometimes they'll, things like kudzu will actually grow over and fade it out and kill everything below it, or some of our climbing ferns, air potato vines, things like that. Um, consider getting rid of those because, you know, popcorn tree, you know, that's, um, you know and, and you may say it's a pretty tree and everything, but what happens, like with the popcorn trees, are the birds eat the, the, the seeds, and then they go and do their business different places, and everywhere they do business, there's popcorn trees popping up. And they're extremely, extremely prolific. So consider getting rid of invasives in your yard because they're altering our native communities, which help our insects and our butterflies and our birds and such. So consider that. Um, and you can do, get rid of them several ways, manual methods, chemical methods, whatever. Um, there's different ways. And you can go to that IFA site that Mary Jo said, um, uh, talked about, and there's some recommendations on how to get rid of them. Or you can go to the county extension office and say, I have a popcorn tree. How do I get rid of it? So you have options there. Um, start planting native plants. And you don't have to plant you know, all at once, every, a whole gigantic your yard, just pick a place. You know, make it simple at first and just start adding to it. You can take your foundation planting. If you have a, a three-foot, um, you know, bed in front of your house, uh, you know, ex you can make it five feet instead and add some really nice perennial flowers to the front of it. Um, consider just adding a, a specimen tree in the middle of the yard somewhere, and you may want to put some shrubs or perennials or herbaceous plants under that. Um, plant for diversity, uh, different height, and as a, a non-native plant um, dies, then consider putting a native plant in there. <coughs> and uh, native plant uh, gardens don't have to look wild. Um, native plants out in the wild do look wild because they are in the wild and they're not tended. But you can add native plants in your yard and they can look beautiful. Um, you can add hard structures like bird baths and pots and bridges and stuff that make everyone realize that yes, this is a garden. You can add mulch that uh, neatens up a whole area and makes it look so, uh, you know, a lot neater. But I think the most, the key thing for making a garden look neat is having well-defined edges. Um, like um, paths or borders and you know, having those nice and neat and well-defined gives that sense of neatness. And so consider that in your garden. Um, this is an example of a garden in the Mobile Botanical Garden. You know, the whole inside there is, is kind of wild looking, but you add that obelisk and you add the border around it and everything and it's beautiful. It was gorgeous. You know, this is a, a, a picture I, I got from Dara that um, uh, it has a whole bunch of different um, wildflowers, um, beach rosemary, black-eyed susans, blanket flower, um, an aster, golden aster. But just look how gorgeous that is because you have a very well-defined border on it. And, and then here they added a little section of grass, which depending on where you're at, what your neighborhood you know, is like, 
adding that section of green is something that, that can really, you know, maybe make your neighbors happier with you. Um, but uh, but just that's very, it makes it very attractive. And I got several different examples. If you look at um, the picture here that's on the um, on my right, for this right, um, you could add you know just a few trees and shrubs. You don't have to add the whole thing. Just add a little bed. Just just add incorporate that. And I just here I got some more pictures showing native plants incorporated into nice neat um, looking gardens. If you have just a small strip, consider putting some perennials in there. Um, these, this, you know, perennial, um, the rubecchias um, are great for butterflies. Um, we have uh, blue-eyed grass up there that um, I thought was very attractive in front of. They added just um, built a little fence that they put uh, coral honeysuckle. So you've got the wildflower in front, the coral, honey, coral honeysuckle, and then a, a shrub behind. Um, Here's just some more examples. Um, we've got the beach, um, the Conradina, the beach um, rosemary there underneath um, that one bed. And they neatened it up by putting pine straw in there. So that, that made it all look nice and neat. And um, um, spiderwort in the, the bottom um, uh, far right side there. You have that nice neat edge. And uh, um, the pine straw looks beautiful. Um, if y'all are into balls and squares and hedges that are all nice and neat. We can do that with natives too. <laughs> there are yopons that are um, they're small and well defined. There are some like this um, far right bottom one. There's a yopon that is trimmed into a mushroom shape. Um, you can trim uh, a lot of things like beauty berries and this oak leaf hydrangea in the upper right into a standard tree um, form. And it makes a beautiful small tree form. And a lot of things like the uh, Tala anise uh, or anise and um, um, yopons, you can also trim into hedges if privacy, once again, is, is one of your, your goals. Um, plan your garden in three dimensions. You may want to consider um, uh, in the, the center um, picture there, those are hickory trees that the limbs on the bottom were cut up to allow more light in to the plants below. You may want to consider doing that to be able to have a more of a diversity of plants in there. Um, plant taller plants toward the back and, and the center of beds to maximize your light conditions. Um, you'll notice like for instance on the right one uh, we've got some looks like June sunflower in the foreground then some wonderful palmettos and then some holly trees back there. But you'll notice we don't put the holly trees out in the front and then the June sunflower behind that, because that would block out the sun. So, you know, smaller things up front toward the back, and you can maximize that light. A um, few things, um, different textures, adding them all together um, can create a lot of interest. Plan for winter. You know, things like berries and interesting bark, like on the birch trees and some hard structures can add a lot of interest in, in the wintertime, as well as those evergreens. Um, consider the sna adding the snag, keeping the snags and logs and such that to attract uh, insects and birds. Use evergreens as screens in addition to that wall between you and your neighbor. You can hide this too. Um, there's all sorts of different ways you can incorporate vines into your yard for attracting hummingbirds. Uh, this is a cross, some cross vines I, I took pictures of of different places where, you know, here they, um, they, they built a small fence that could go on. Another one they built trellises. The other one is just a large support structure that covered two stories. So you can do a lot. Um, with all of them, as Julie had mentioned, though, you want to pick the right place for the uh, right plant for the right place. You want to look at the conditions that they grow in and make sure that you try to replicate those as much as possible. Consider the mature height and width of the plant. And planting in pots may be a solution if you, if you live in a, a con condominium or a part, small apartment or you don't have a much of a yard, consider planting you know, some pots. You can have a nice um, butterfly plants in there that can attract butterflies and such. And birds can fly to your condo. <laughs> <laughs> Where to get native? From native plant nurseries, from friends. You can get plants and seeds, places like this, uh, bits like this, but don't get them from public lands. 
um, please. A lot of our wildflowers are in demise uh, are, are, you know, because people have been harvesting them too much uh, in, the, in the native lands. Um, don't get them from private lands without permission because you don't know that person may be loving that plant and you just went over there and stole it. Um, <laughs> ask for native plants when you go to stores. You know, show the demand. It's, you know, it's one of those things that the more you have a demand, the more, you know, it's that supply-demand thing. You know, people will, will provide what you demand. And this is a neonicotinoid. That's how you spell it. <laughs> Just, uh, just something to, you know, if, if there's a plant that says, you know, that insects won't eat it because it's been treated, whatever, um, beware of that because insects won't eat it because they'll, they'll, they'll eat it, they'll get poison, and that's, you know. <laughs> so it's not a, you know, so something to be concerned with that. Takeaway is that, um, as you saw from the first presentation, our bird populations are, are, are shrinking. A lot of this is because we're losing a lot of our native habitat. Um, and our, our native plants, our insects are also, that was something that hasn't really been brought up, but our, our number of insects has reduced drastically um, over the years also. Um, um, and we don't have as many of our, our large natural areas because of developments that, that we used to have that were just plain there for, for nature. Um, the good news is that um, we can provide food, water, and shelter for most of the, you know, the birds that we have coming here. We can provide them in, in our yard. Um, and even a small area, we can make a difference. And so in summary, um, we live in an area of wonderful diversity. We have a lot of great, wonderful native plants and birds and such. Um, we told you about the status of our local birds tonight. Um, and. Uh, Dara talked to you about the importance of native plants and their role with birds. Um, Julie talked to us about native plants for our area. Mary Jo told you about um, a whole bunch of uh, you know, great info sites that you can go and you can find out such wonderful information and help you select what plants to put in your yard. And um, I'm talking to you about some things that you can do, like that border between you and the neighbors. You go run out there now, I to do that. Um, but planting native plants is one of the highest impact things we can do to help our birds. So uh, what we're wanting you to do is take this information and go out there and, and make a difference. And that's why we're here. So with that, we're going to say thank you. <laughs> I have um, the, the last plant drawing, and I just say one thank you all. This has just been wonderful seeing the, the interest, and, and y'all just go out there and plant plants. Okay. <laughs> so we had a, a seopsi daisy here, um, and this one will grow in high salt environment, so if somebody is, needs um, salt uh, air environment. And this goes to... <laughs> it's a bummer getting old. Zero, two, one. Yay. You like this. has yellow flowers. Real pretty. Okay. Our next one is a lyre-leaf sage. This is another of our salvias. This one has purple flowers. And this goes to 983. 983. Oh, yay. Over there. Great. Thank you, Lorna. And our next one is a, a, a dotted horse mint or a spotted bee balm. Um, this one goes to 964. Oh, yes. Yay. <laughs> All right. Woo-hoo. Is that in the back then? Yeah. Okay. All right. This one is a tree. This is a popular tree. This one will get big, but it is a host plant for one of our swallowtail butterflies. I forget which one, but it is... Um, 962. 962? Yay! There you are. All right. The next one is blue eyed grass. This is a beautiful little perennial. It's really an iris, not a grass. They try to fool you. Um, 020. Yay! Is that yours? All right. It's beautiful. You'll love it. Okay, we have a, um, it looks like a, a, a seaside goldenrod. I'm not sure which goldenrod this is, but they're all great. 
904. 904, yay. All right. Okay, this is a twofer. You got blue curls, which is a neat little perennial, and this right here is Virginia Sweet Spire, which is a small shrub, has white flowers, and it has a pretty fall color, too. And that goes to 900. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you get the two for. Woo that makes it to be something else in here, too. So, all right. And our last one is a beauty berry and with the purple flowers and that will go to 957 957 lose your lose okay next one 016 oh man are you 016 Larry all right Larry yay you got beauty berry all right and that's all our for our formal um, meeting tonight, our, our event. Um, we've got books for sale. Dara's selling her plants that are over there. So if you want to, you know, consider buying those. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.